Good morning, everyone. Uh, congratulations to my colleagues on yesterday and uh, to everyone who was involved in election. My apologies on this hearing being the day after election at 10 a.m. My deepest and serious apologies. My name is Councilmember Jamani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Councilmember Rodriguez and Councilmember Cohen. We're here to hold a hearing on three bills, and I think Councilmember Grodenchik was here. Uh, we're, here to hear holding, we're here to hold a hearing on three bills. The first two bills, intro for number 1458, sponsored by Councilmember Lander, and intro number 1467, sponsored by myself, which regulate the application and approval process for cooperative apartments. Intro number 1458 will require cooperative corporations to provide specific reasons for withholding consent to the sale of a cooperative apartment. And intro number 1467 would regulate the application process for cooperative apartments in order to ensure that applicants receive timely approvals or denials by informing prospective purchasers of their decision within 45 days of receiving an application. The third bill, a pre-considered intro sponsored by Councilmember Grodenchik, would increase the assessed value limitation of J51 tax abatement eligible improvements to $32,000 per dwelling unit and would increase each year by the cost of living adjustment percentage. I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Megan Chen, counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst to the committee, and Sarah Gasson, the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify to please fill out a card with the sergeant at arms. And our first panel will be Francesca Marte, assistant commissioner of HPD, Miriam Colomb, assistant commissioner for tax credits and incentives, and Dana Sussman, deputy commissioner for commission on human rights. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. yes I do. Thank you. You can begin in the order of your preference. Uh, good morning, Chair Williams and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Um, congratulations on your reelection. Uh, my name is Francesc Marti, and I am the Assistant Commissioner of the Division of Government Affairs with the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Here with me today is Miriam Colon, Assistant Commissioner for Tax Credits and Incentives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the pre-considered introduction sponsored by Council Member Grodenchik. This bill would increase the J51 assessed valuation eligibility cap for cooperatives and condominiums, mirroring recent state legislation. The J51 benefit program is a property tax abatement and or exemption given to residential apartment buildings for certain alterations or improvements. Boiler or window replacements are common types of eligible work. After doing the rehabilitation work, owners are eligible for J51 for a J51 tax abatement and in certain cases a J51 tax exemption as well. The abatement is an actual reduction in the amount of, a, of tax an owner pays and is related to the cost of the work. The exemption, on the other hand, effectively freezes the building's assessed value so the owner doesn't have to pay taxes on the increase in value resulting from the rehab work. All J51 recipients receive abatements, but exemptions are only issued in cases where the city determines that the J51 eligible renovation will lead to an increase in assessed value. Since 2013, uh, the only cooperative and condominium units eligible for the program, with certain exemptions for governmentally assisted work and PHFL cooperatives, are those units that have an, assessed, an average assessed value of less than 30,000 at the time of commencement of the alterations or improvements. While HPD believes that high-priced condos should not receive the benefits of the J51 program, Chapter 388 of the state laws of 2016 made modest reforms to the condo and co-op AV cap to keep up with inflation. Specifically, this new state law allows the AV cap for condos and co-ops to increase to 32,000, and subsequent cost of living increases after that can bring the cap to 35,000 over time. This local enabling legislation drafted to match the recent expansion in state law will enable the expansion of the J51 benefit program to some affordable co-op and condo owners. Therefore, HPD supports this bill. There are some technical amendments that, that, that we need to do to the bill, but, but we are in support of the bill. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to testify on this bill. I look forward to answering any questions you may have at this time.
Good morning, um, Chair Williams and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings and Councilmember Lander. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and I'm here to testify today on two bills, Intro 1458 and Intro 1467. Intro 1458 would create both a private right of action and give jurisdiction to the Commission to investigate and adjudicate claims by co-op applicants who are not provided with a statement from the co-op as to why it is denying a co-op application within five days of making the determination. The bill outlines what exactly must be included in the statement, including reasons why the application is deficient, if any, and a report of the number of applications received by the co-op and the number of applications rejected within the past three years. Intro 1458 requires statutory damages between $1,000 and $25,000 to the complaining party for violations of its mandates and requires punitive damages if non-compliance is found to have been willful. Intro 1467 requires that co-ops have a standardized application and list of requirements for all prospective purchasers and sellers, requires that co-ops provide an acknowledgement of application materials received within 10 days of receiving them, requires that co-ops issue a determination on an application within 45 days, creates a private right of action and gives jurisdiction to the Commission to adjudicate claims by co-op applicants if the process I just described is not adhered to. The bill also lays out a damages framework for each type of violation. It is critical to note that under existing law, if anyone believes they were denied a co-op or their application was rejected based on, even in part, a discriminatory reason, they can and should bring their complaint to the Commission where we can investigate the claim, require the co-op to provide us with documentation regarding that application and other applications, provide information about any other individuals approved or denied by the co-op, and any other relevant documents. The Commission can also call witnesses in for interviews and look at the building's financials in order to determine whether there is probable cause that discrimination occurred. If the Commission finds liability, it may order civil penalties, compensatory damages to the complainant, or changes to policies, posting requirements, training, and other forms of affirmative relief. The Commission opposes these two bills because neither bill expands existing civil rights protections for applicants that these bills purport to better protect. The Commission's jurisdiction is exclusively tied to discrimination based on articulated protected categories in the area of employment, housing, public accommodations, discriminatory harassment, and bias-based profiling by law enforcement. To give the Commission jurisdiction over disclosure, reporting, and timing requirements without any explicit connection to discrimination would be unprecedented, would divert resources away from the critical work of the agency, and require a dramatic shift in the workflow, training, skill set, and dockets of the Law Enforcement Bureau at the Commission. We are more than willing to work with the bill sponsors to address and root out discrimination in co-ops and to think creatively about how to make the process more transparent, but we do not believe that giving the Commission jurisdiction over such disclosure and reporting requirements is the way to do it. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Is, are you giving to someone else? Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go directly uh, past mine for the, for the time being and go with uh, Councilmember Lander. Denchik and, and then Cohen. Uh, we'll try to see if we can do it without the timer for a uh, second, particularly because uh, the sponsors did not give an opening statement. Uh, but if it gets too long, <laughs> reserve the right to kind of bring us back on timing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Williams, uh, for convening this hearing and for working together with me uh, on these bills. Uh, thank you both to the Commission and to HBD for hearing, uh, being here to testify. Um, and uh, Deputy Commissioner, you know I have a great regard for you and for the Commission um, I, I, for reasons I will explain. I really find this testimony highly unpersuasive. Um, I believe, and I'll ask you some questions of whether you believe, that there is um, very real discrimination that takes place uh, uh, against co-op co applicants, uh, especially around race, but other protected classes uh, under the New York City Human Rights Law that they are protected from, uh, and that it is extremely difficult to do anything about as we are currently structured. Um, and that while that's not most people's experiences, it is enough that we're compelled to do something about it. It is harassment, it is against the law, it is discrimination, and it leads to segregation. And we know it, and we're doing essentially nothing about it. And the tools we have are completely inadequate. The tools we're offering would actually be really helpful. They are entirely related to discrimination. We might have linked these bills together instead of had them as two separate bills, but they do, they're necessary to link together to provide a framework where people have a set of rights and where the reasons are provided in a way that make it possible to have actionable 
uh, investigation. So um, I guess a, just a few questions first. I mean, do, do you believe that there is very likely discrimination taking place against co-op applicants, you know, based on protected classes and categories under the human rights law in New York City? I, you know, our, our position on this bill is not related to our belief that discrimination occurs in housing, in co-ops, in rental units across the board. You know, I don't think any borough or zip code is immune, um, but, but what our, our position is, is not that discrimination does not exist and we should not be doing more, but that this is not the way to get at it. But I mean, I need to establish some baseline here. Do, mm -hmm. do you think it exists in the co-op market? Absolutely. We do not, we do not disagree with that. I don't have, you know. And, and how, what have we done about it? How many complaints have you gotten? How many investigations have you done? And in how many cases have we made findings of any kind about discrimination in the co-op market? The the proportion of cases that involve co-ops at the commission across our housing docket is lo is small, and we you know how, how many? I I cannot give you a number. Um, our, so low that it doesn't find it find its way into the annual reports. It is not in our annual report, and the reason because it's so low, we don't measure. Not it. necessarily. We, it be, it's because historically at the commission, our case tracking system had no field for it. We are moving forward with a, to track this information, but we cannot actually track it historically over the past two, three, four, five years. So moving forward, we are tracking that number. What I can tell you is from conversations that I've had internally in preparation for this hearing, the number is quite low, and I think there's a whole host of reasons why that might be the case. Um, certainly, um, we work with some of the most vulnerable members of our community, and most of those folks are seeking rental units. Um, and so we, we are often, the vast majority of our cases involve rental units. It's not to say that I'm going to stop you there because if the suggestion is that people of color, people with disabilities, women, people who are LGBT don't face discrimination in the cooperative marketplace not, because they're not poor, that is, I mean, really violates the spirit of the human rights law. That is absolutely not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that Sounds the vast like majority it. of our cases right now, I think a, a combination of people who are coming to the commission to file complaints, the um, outreach and education and the work that we're doing, and the vast majority of the market in New York City involves rental units. So I think it's it's a reflection of several different areas, several different reasons, but we can certainly do more education and outreach to folks who are seeking co to access the co-op market. Okay. I mean, uh, I'll just start by, I, I think your answer was, we have no data on, we have not done any measurable enforcement. We don't have any measurable complaints. We have not been able to do any measurable investigations on discrimination in the cooperative marketplace. We can agree or disagree, like it's not pro rata cooperative to rentals. We just don't have any. And the reason we don't have any is it's impossible to bring up meaningful claim right now under our law. So I want to ask about rentals first, right, because a law that we passed at the beginning of this term and that you guys are implementing in the rental market uh, established proactive investigations, right? Can you tell me a little bit about, about how you do proactive investigations in the rental market? Sure. So we... Um there's a, there's a few different ways that we do it. We do it through matched pair testing, which involves sending out um, someone that is a member of a, a protected category to seek housing and then someone who is not, and we identify whether they're treated differently, whether the, um, the unit is no longer available or people are being um, you know, derailed into substandard housing. Um, we also will, when we see ads that are discriminatory on their face, um, we can do affirmative investigations and, and, and issue and do commission initiated cases that way so we don't need someone to, to come in with a claim. Um, we have ex certainly expanded our commission initiated work to target large scale landlords that are engaging in systemic pattern and practice discrimination and we've you know, announced many of those and we've issued some of the highest penalties um, in those cases um, and we've been using them as sort of to make examples to, uh, to show that this kind of behavior is unacceptable. So, so we have both the matched pair testing component, we also just have affirmative commission initiated investigations that we move forward when we identify that there's, um, you know, a systemic issue going on. So a few things here. First, thank you, and I want to praise that work. The Commission is doing really good work there. You have increased it dramatically under Commissioner Malalas's and your leadership. The Council's proud to be a partner in that, and we feel really good about it. 
Second, for folks in the audience who might feel like we're unfairly targeting co-ops, I would just point out, like, this is something we did together three years ago. We thought it was critical to strengthen our uh, investigation and enforcement and testing in the rental marketplace for the reasons that you identified. It's very much of the market. Uh, we are not targeting co-ops. We're targeting housing discrimination. It takes place in the rental market. We have some strategies for dealing with it. It takes place in the co-op market, and we have no strategies for dealing with it. It's, it's infeasible to do matched pair testing or significant testing in the co-op market, correct? It, it, yes. It, there, we've, we've sort of um, discussed how that might work, and it, it would be very, very challenging. We'd have to fake people's bank records right, create, and fake entire, where they lived yeah. before. It's not like a resume that you can do in employment or so. Right. So we just don't have that as a way of, of testing. So. And then, even if people come in with complaints because they're confident that they were discriminated against, the, the co-ops aren't required to keep any meaningful information. So you say here in the testimony that you can require the co-op to provide you with documentation. What documentation are they required to keep? We would look at whatever... What documentation are they required by law to keep? I, I know that co-ops are regulated on the state level. I, I'm unfamiliar with that frame, with that framework. Nothing that would help investigate or prosecute a case about discrimination. They might keep it, Council and Member, if they did keep it. We're at about eight minutes, so if you can. Okay. Um, so I will, I will wrap up then. Well, I wonder, because I, I do have one or two more questions, but um, I, I guess I'll just put them out there like this. The, you know, so without any information, it's very difficult to make an investigation. All these bills would do is require people to provide the reason that someone was rejected so that then you would, in fact, be able to get that information. And if someone used a discriminatory reason, you would obviously have that. And if someone lied, you'd have a place to start an investigation. And if someone wrote the truth, it'd be very easy for that co-op to show that they did not discriminate and that they made their judgments based on non-discriminatory grounds. Not hard for co-ops. Honestly, not hard for you. It would not require a dramatic shift of resources there are not going to be tons of these cases, and the investigation is super straightforward since all you have to do is get the piece of paper about that they gave their reasons on. And these things are linked. It's true, maybe we should have kept them in one bill rather than two, but the whole idea of the timeline resulting in the declination is so that there is a paper trail and so that it would be available to you when people came with complaints. So um, I'll, I'll stop Thank there, you. but it's a pretty modest burden on co-ops. It's a pretty modest burden on the commission, and it's the only thing I've heard, though I'm inviting anyone today to give it, that would provide any meaningful protection to people who have been discriminated against in the cooperative marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member. Um, I, just have, I have a couple questions. I'm going to go Council Member Gordenchik. <clears throat> What's the, do you have complaints about anything related to discrimination in the housing market that's not rentals? Purchasing homes, mortgages. Um, we do. I don't. We know. We also cover, in addition to sort of housing discrimination that most people are familiar with, we have sort of uh, uh, there are prohibitions against discrimination in, in lending and mortgage terms and conditions and credit. So we can. I don't have those those numbers, but we do have cases involving. Um, do you know if the numbers are high or low? I would say that, again, the, the vast majority of our cases involving sort of the housing transaction are uh, involve rentals. So those numbers would be l on the low. Well, I, that, that, um, that right there, I, I mean, just to what Councilmember Lander said, because we know for a fact, particularly in lending, uh, you mentioned that specifically, uh, that in this past housing market, the vast majority of people who lost the most in housing were black and Latino residents who were steered toward um, lending products that they didn't need because they had very high credit scores and were very similar to uh, their, their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. and so if we don't have a lot of complaints there, that might mean we don't have either the mechanism to collect it or people don't know they can go to HR, uh, what's it called now, CHR, CHR <laughs> to make those complaints. So I know for a fact, and we all know for a fact, that that existed in lending. So if you don't have the numbers there, I'm not sure how to trust uh, what you're saying about the co-ops. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sure. I can, I can see if we can provide those numbers and get back to you shortly sure. after the hearing. But just even what you said, you, your assumption is that it will be very low because mm -hmm. most of what you have is rentals. Mm -hmm. So we very well may have a, a just as large as an issue in the co-ops as we did in the lending, mm -hmm. but they're just not complaining for some of the reasons that Councilmember Lander said. Right. So I don't know that the testimony that you've given uh, suggests that there is not a problem. It may suggest that we don't have the proper mechanisms uh, to deal with it right now. 
I too, you also mentioned uh, that the bill would divert resources away from the critical work of the agency. Um, th that testimony is kind of weird because if we give you the power to do it, this now becomes the work of the agency. So how would it divert? So right now our, our agency is structured um, so that we are doing um, broader and more deep investigations um, as complaints come in. So the, we have attorney investigators. When you um, have an appointment at the commission to come in, you meet with an attorney right away, which is very, I think, unusual for, you know, for a government agency. Um, we are doing thorough investigations based on discrimination. This would um, require us to track um, reporting um, timing and disclosures um, that don't have an overt link to discrimination. So it would, um, we, we could conceive of this taking um, significant resources from our, our administrative staff um, and um, in how? In that we would not so our, we have limited administrative staff for, the, for, our, for our attorneys to support the work that the attorneys are doing. And um, instead of supporting the cases, the, the, the investigations, the prosecution of discrimination cases, they would be um, handling the paperwork involved in these, um, it, with these bills and the requirements with these bills. So we would not want so to So would you need additional funding to, to do this is what you're saying? I think that it could potentially divert resources away from the work that the Commission is currently doing and working to make the Commission as robust an agency um, as possible. All right. That's a, I, I'm just concerned now because what I'm hearing is not that there isn't discrimination in things other than rentals, but that we have no mechanism in the city to really capture it. That's even more concerning to me uh, and more of a reason why I think a bill like this would be necessary. I think that there's, you know, we are certainly committed to, um, you know, we, we agree that there are significant and systemic issues with respect to co-ops, with respect to lending practices. Um, we are committed to partnering with, with, with both council members on education and outreach. Um, we, you know, we can create forms that people have so they know exactly who to contact if they feel that they've been denied um, the co-op or the application, the, the terms of the application has changed based on a discriminatory motivation. Um, we also, just to remind folks, people do not need to come to the commission with a case wrapped up in a bow. We, if people even have a suspicion that something went awry based on their protected status. But again, status, because of, I guess, as Cousin Melinda said, what's a required for the board to keep Mm -hmm. is, is, is not really clear or maybe minimum. I'm not even sure the type of case that can be built without laws like the ones we're presenting. I think one concern that we have around, um, around these reporting requirements is that the paperwork will probably not help give us much information to work with, that um, co-ops will not be disclosing information that will be fruitful for the commission in their investigation. And so essentially, it's a requirement that we don't think will further the commission's investigations. Okay, thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Mendez, and we'll have uh, Council Member Grodenchik, um, who are also, because he's a sponsor and didn't give opening, try to give a, uh, some leeway in questioning. And thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll go to five minutes for Council Member Cohen and Council Member Rosenthal if she comes up. Mr. Chair, thank you. I want to thank you for you and your staff for the quick movement on the 30, uh, on the 51J. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind this morning. On the bill that will will uh, will give tax relief to uh, middle income co-ops throughout the city of New York. Um, but I'm right now. I'd like to talk a little to the deputy commissioner. She's getting some water. So, um, if somebody feels in the city of New York that they have been discriminated, whether it's by a co-op or a rental or any business, anybody. They can turn to the Human Rights Commission. There are other outlets, though, as well, that they could turn to. The, the state has a commission on human rights, and I assume that the AG will also take these complaints as well? Sure, yes. Can you yes. describe that process a little? Um, so I, I, I won't ex represent the, the exact process of my uh, sister agencies, but there is the New York State Division of Human Rights, which is a state agency with multiple locations in the city. Um, the Attorney General's Office is a Civil Rights Bureau. Um, 
There is, you know. Uh, and the AG also oversees co-ops and condos as well, is my understanding. That may not be your understanding, but that's my understanding. My understanding is limited, so I defer to you. Um, so there are a host of different resources for individuals to access if they feel like they've been discriminated against. Um, different pr the protections vary a little bit. We like to say that the city human rights law is the broadest um, and most comprehensive in many ways, but there are different um, frame legal frameworks that we, we operate under the city law. The state operates, obviously, under the state law. And I would assume that since your agency has um co-interest with the other, with the AG's office and with the state division that from time to time you probably talk to them about issues that are important to the people of the state and the city of New York. Would we that do, be? Yes. yes. And um, you indicate in your testimony that um, you really have not received many complaints about this issue regarding discrimination from co-op or condo boards. Is that correct as well? That, that's right. It, it, it does represent a minority of, a, you know, a small proportion of the cases in our housing docket. A very small proportion? I would say so, yeah. Because these are, these are, these are, not, these are regulated by the state and they, they have to get approvals from time to time from the AG um, for filing plans and all those kind of things. So I assume that it would be a reasonable assumption and we're going to hear from some of the, the people in the co-op and condo industry a little later when they testify. I think it's a reasonable assumption that they don't want to run afoul of the regulatory bodies. Would that be a reasonable assumption? I, I, I certainly don't want to represent okay. the, the, the beliefs of, of the folks who will be testifying here today. Is it fair to state, though, that th this may be a, a solution looking for a problem? I would not represent that either. Okay. I All do right. think there is a significant problem. I don't disagree with uh, Council Members Lander and Williams here on this. I just think that um, we, we may have a difference of opinion as to how best to address it. Okay. I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to defer the rest of my time. Um, to my colleague, Mr. Cohn. I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for moving the J-51 bill so quickly. Uh, and we'll be hearing from the co-ops on, on that as well. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I did want to go back. I had, I had to take a second to review the language of the bill because some, some of the testimony was confusing me. So did this divert resources issue? I, I, I'm confused because the way you made it seem as if you would now have to proactively go and look at a bunch of paperwork. But the way the law is, you would be responding to complaints. Is that your understanding? That's right. That's right. And, and I do apologize if, if my um, testimony or my answers to your questions um, misrepresented that. We would essentially, our jurisdiction would expand in a way that, that it has not historically. We are, we are regularly adding new protections like the Fair Chance Act, the credit discrimination law, the salary history law, which we enacted last, which went into effect last so week. Just, just, I just want to clarify, basically you're testifying that you don't want to respond to additional complaints of discrimination that may arise from the passage of these bills talking about discrimination. No, no, no. If I may, um, we, these bills do not address or the, the disclosures and the reporting here would not, um, do not identify or would not be t tethered to a claim of discrimination. This would simply be the commission enforcing timing and disclosure requirements. So there would not be an investigation into discrimination. We would, we would be tracking that people are responding in a timely way, that they're submitting paperwork in the proper format. Um, and that is something that has not been done or contemplated. Well, well couldn't before. that be solved? I, I don't know if I haven't spoken to my colleague, but if, if we made it so that people would use this if they feel they've been discriminated, then it would then be connected to a discrimination claim. I think that if we were to make the connection to discrimination more explicit, I think that could be a way to, um, you know, to, to fold it into the work that the commission is situated to do. So the language I just said would actually make it more explicit. I, I think we would have to go back and kind of consult with our teams to talk about what the language might look like. I'm asking you if the language I said made it more explicit. I would, if you don't Basically mind. Basically saying um, to use this law, it would have to be used only if someone believed they were discriminated against. I think the, the issue here is that the requirement is on the co-op board to provide the information. And so I would be rather surprised that, a, that anyone would or a co-op board would identify discriminatory motivation in the paperwork they're submitting. Um, so but that's not what I said, though. I said me as a complainant would be bringing this in because I believed I was discriminated against 
using these things, and then I would bring it to the CHR. Certainly, if anyone believes they've been discriminated against with or without this, this, these bills, they can come to the commission and we can initiate investigation. So um, I, I think that as the bills are drafted right now, which is really what I can speak to, um, the, the bills are not, they are neutral with respect to whether there is any sort of discrimination, discriminatory animus or motivation. Well, I'm committed to minimally making a little less neutral. So hopefully that will solve uh, the issue you brought up. And also, I guess your other part of the complaint, your other part of the uh, pushback would be a budgetary uh, constraint, and perhaps you may want to make a budgetary um, request to the council if for some reason. I, I don't know that these would have any particular impact, because I don't know you'll have a deluge of uh, complaints with, like we did with some of the others, um, but if you did feel that way, there's always an opportunity to make a budgetary request. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, council Member Cohen for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm really scratching my head here because I'm not sure, are, are we trying to regulate or are we concerned about a few bad apples or is there a systemic problem here that we're trying to regulate? And it seems clear to me from sort of both sides of the debate that no one has any idea if there's a problem and what the scope of it is. Why are we uh, p placing a potentially very uh, uh, burdensome regulation on co-ops when we don't have any sense of the scope, if there's a problem, and what the scope of it is. And I'm sort of, you know, I know you've not been able to come up with actual numbers, but I mean, one uh, uh, avenue of relief seems to be that you have a very, very small number of complaints. So I really am uh, scratching my head here. You know, maybe this is a, an opportunity for another uh, uh, important council reporting bill, but I, I just can't see uh, uh, what we're the problem. What the problem is at this point, it, it seems very undefined. And again, I'm concerned about maybe you know there may be bad apples. Maybe there is a systemic problem. I have no idea. But I am pretty clear on the fact that I represent a lot of modest co-ops. I don't represent Fifth Avenue or Park Avenue. I have a lot of very modest co-ops where the board members are all volunteers. Uh, and adding an element of litigation to these, they can't, they can't bear that burden. Uh, they're volunteers, they're people who come together to live you know, in a, in a co-op building, uh, that's how it's designed. Uh, if the board is not functioning, if the board is discriminating, the board members uh, you know, can't sell their apartments for discriminatory reasons. I would think that the board members would be very unhappy about that. Uh, so there is an opportunity for self-regulation. I, I, I really am just scratching my head here as to what we're trying to get at. And I think that this potentially could end, you know, again, maybe people on Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue could survive with, these, with this additional level of regulation. But I think the modest co-ops that I represent would really be placed under tremendous burden. Uh, I know there was no question in there. Uh, I am sort of curious as, in terms of uh, what kind of evidence your agency would accept at a, at a hearing like this. You, you mentioned that evidence is a, a, what would be the kind of evidence that you hear? Sure. So um, the the commission in sort of the first phase of, of the work that we do is a neutral investigation. So our attorney investigators act as a neutral party when it, once a complaint is filed. Um, and and the, the case is very, um, you know, case by case, but certainly disclosure of documents, as I mentioned, um, building financials. Um, we would look at sort of who is who are the, the decision makers of the co-op, the makeup of the building, um, who's been denied. Um, we, we can interview witnesses, um, both, you know, complaints and complainants identified witnesses and, and members of the co-op board um, and other decision makers from the respondent, um, the management company, um, whoever may be relevant to provide information. Um, and we will sort of make an assessment based on that both documentation and witness test, witness interviews and, um, and at that sort of the conclusion of the investigation, we would issue either a probable cause finding or a no probable cause finding, which is essentially more likely than not that discrimination occurred. At that point, or any point along the process, we can negotiate a conciliation, which is essentially a settlement between the city, the complaining party, and the responding party. Um, similar to a settlement, and um, or we can go, once we issue probable cause, we can go to trial at oath. Um, and then there's, at that point, once the commission has issued probable cause, the commission is no longer a neutral investigator, but is litigating the case on behalf of the interest of the complainant and the, and the city at large in rooting out discrimination. Um, but again, anywhere along that process, we can negotiate a resolution, um, which, um, which we regularly do, um, and that can involve simply for smaller respondents 
you know, education, training requirements, uh, disclosure requirements, reporting requirements, back to the commission, uh, posting notices of rights, things like that, ensuring that the, the respondents are trained on the law and know what their obligations are. Um, it could involve fines, it could involve damages to the complaining party, um, and other affirmative relief. If a building is, uh, or a co-op is, is relatively homogenous in its population, is that evidence of discrimination? Um, I think that alone might not, I mean, again, it, it really would be case by case. I think that if someone is making an allegation that they believe that they are otherwise qualified, that the application was going through, you know, seamlessly, and then they appeared at the interview and something shifted, and then we looked at the demographics of the apartment building and um, it was, you know, did not have any one of that particular protected category, I think that would be, um, I think that would be a factor, certainly, that we would consider in the broader investigation, but I wouldn't be able to speak to sort of broader hypotheticals. That alone may not be enough, but, um, but I think it would certainly be a factor that we would consider. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to make clear uh, for the, the listeners and the watchers at 2 o'clock in the morning, because some people do watch these, uh, that the onerous requirements we're talking about are, are really um, time frames, and so 458 is requiring that within five days of deciding to withhold consent from a sale of cooperative apartment to a prospective purchaser to provide specific reasons for withholding such consent. There are some additional things, but that is primarily what it is. And for 1467, would need to inform prospective purchasers of the decision within 45 days of receiving the application with the option of a 14-day extension with the purchaser's consent. Now, we can argue, I think, about what the time frame could be. I don't find any of those to be overly cumbersome to be able to push forward a sale or not a sale with specific reasons. That doesn't seem to be overly cumbersome. It seems like it should be something that's regulated so that people aren't waiting forever to decide, uh, waiting forever to hear if they're allowed to purchase a co-op or not, and the reasons why they shouldn't be. And based on the anecdotal evidence that we have, those, re those things and the, the, lack of, uh, the lack of structure there is allowing people to discriminate uh, for one reason or the other. I just want to make sure I put that on the record because we're discussing things as if we're providing some brand new way of selling or some overly cumbersome structure, and we're not doing that at all. And again, I just want to point out that we both, just in this discussion, have talked about other demonstrable types of discrimination that has happened that CRH does not have any particular record of and has not captured, so that we know those types of things are out there even if we don't have the numbers to show it. And so it's important that we use information we're getting as council members and the people in the field to address these concerns. I wanted to make sure I put that on the record. Um, I know Council Member Grodenchik had an additional question, then we're gonna go to Council Member Rosenthal and Mendez for five minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to discriminate for a board of directors of a co-op to discriminate it would take collusion, wouldn't it, of at least the majority of the board uh, to deny somebody based on sex, race, religion, you know, gender, any of those things. It would take a lot of work to discriminate, wouldn't it? I, again, I, I can't speak to that. I think it, it, it would vary. It could be one, one person. It could be a group of people. I don't think it's particularly difficult to discriminate. Um, I think there's, um, there's both explicit discrimination happening in the city there's, and also implicit bias um, that I think we encounter um, and many of us are, you know, a party to every single day. So I, I, I don't think that it is a, would be a, a sort of a massive collusive effort on the part of the, of the co-op board to discriminate necessarily, but again, these would be case-by-case -case scenarios that we would investigate each individually. For it to be systemic, though, you would need to have people willing to sustain discrimination over a longer period of time than maybe one case, and obviously one case is one too many, but we don't seem to have a, a vast amount of cases coming to, to your agency or the AG's office or the state office, do we? While our number may be small, I think what we've all sort of identified here is that um, that these cases are harder and more complicated than denial of rental units, for example. Um, and sometimes those cases involve quite explicit discrimination, um, whereas I think 
because, and I, you know, I understand the council member's concern here around uh, the lack of transparency in the co-op process. Um, and so I think that these cases are harder, um, but again, we are, and we are committed to, to sort of rooting out discrimination wherever it occurs, whether it's in co-ops, condos, um, rentals, lending practices, um, but all these cases do look, they do look different de depending on the facts of the case, the structure of the, of the building, um, and, and how the, the building operates. And I think we're all committed, all of my colleagues here, everybody on the council, all 51 members, we're all committed to rooting out discrimination. I think, though, that the burden that would be placed on individual members of co-op boards, on individual co-ops, I have approximately, maybe even more than 20,000 families that live in co-ops. And as my colleague, Mr. Cohn, said, these are not wealthy people, generally. They're middle-income families. Typically, they're, you know, they may be a firefighter married to a school teacher. They may be a police officer. They may be a correction officer, city employees, many people who work in private industry. LIJ is a huge employer. Um, but they provide a wonderful way of life in my community with some of the best schools in the nation. I stack my schools up against anybody. I'm very proud of them. Uh, my last question is to you, can you tell me the last time there was a sustained judgment against the co-op board for discrimination in the city of New York by your agency? I cannot. I can find that out for you and get back to you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Mendez, five minutes each. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Williams. You know, I'm sitting here listening and, and being very aware of the difference between all of our districts and what we each, uh, including you know the sponsors of these bills, what what we experience in our districts and and draw from that. Um, but I, and and there's no question that accountability for the cooperatives. Uh, is incredibly important. So I, I do thank Council Members Williams and, and Lander for taking the issue on. That being said, um, I've heard a lot of concerns from my constituents about these bills as they are drafted that they would put a real strain, and I understand your point about number of days, but that in total they would put a real strain on the functioning of the co-op um, the functioning of the co-op, whether it's a large co-op or a small one. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping to be a voice today that calls for a way to ad address the critical goal of the legislation, but in a way that works for the cooperative. So in other words, is there another way to achieve these goals? Um, one constituent, and not that I have a great suggestion or alternative, but I want the alternative, um, and I'm hoping that we can get at the alternative in this hearing. Uh, one, one constituent raised the possibility that if forced to come up with a uniform set of standards, the co-op board will just raise the income and the wealth requirements and thus make it more a systemic now uh, problem. It's gonna, the risk is, is that it will be obviously even harder for less wealthy applicants to make it through the process. Um, I guess that was a statement, but could I hear your thoughts about that? Sorry, just before you do, um, we have a class of students upstairs from PS89 from Council Member Espinal's district. Just want to say, hey, hope you guys are having a good time. <laughs> So I think that raises a huge concern. Um, you know, I think that there is there is economic segregation, there's racial segregation, there's you know a whole host of issues in the housing market. Um, I think we're all familiar with them. I think that they're incredibly serious and something that you know I know the administration, I know City Council is committed to addressing. I, um, you know, I, it sounds like this is potentially a challenge for your constituents and the communities that you serve. Um, I, I can't speak to that. I, I just, I, you know, from the, from the commission's perspective, um, you know, we certainly want there to be access to co-ops, access to um, apartments of all types for people. And, you know, I think there, we're committed to figuring out a solution and a way to address this um, and, and think creatively with all of you about how to do that. 
Well, I really appreciate that. I mean, I guess, you know, as I'm hearing you talk about it, you know, for the Upper West Side, it's sort of the easy solution. Let's just, you know, it's, you know, these are people who are volunteers who have a load to take on and they're just going to make it easy for themselves um, by establishing criteria that are going to have unintended terrible consequences. And, you know, we already have you know, it's already pretty darn expensive, and we are losing, if you look at the census over time, we're already losing our low-income families and our minorities, uh, minority populations. And uh, I don't want to inadvertently do anything that perpetuates that trend. Um, you know, how are we going to make it easier for lower-income uh, families to have home ownership without legislating that. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe we have to legislate it, I don't, you know, brighter minds than mine. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I wanna express my real concern about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is it morning still? Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it may be. Uh, first, I want to um, echo my agreement with a lot of the uh, statement made by council member, he's still here, Andy Cohen. And um, look, well, you know, I'm, I'm in a unique position because I actually represent a lot of people on Fifth Avenue, east side of Fifth Avenue. And, and I represent a lot of wealthy co-op and, co and condo owners in Gramercy Park. But I also represent a lot of limited equity cooperatives, HDFCs, in the Lower East Side and East Village. So um, I think that what we're trying to achieve by this legislation is a good goal, but I don't know that this gets us where we need to be. And I do worry that it's burdensome. So as someone who resides in a limited equity cooperative, seven units, rather small, when an apartment became available in the building, and we had a very short period to accept applications, we got a lot of them. So if you live in a big building, like in Andy Cohen's district over at Skyview, where there's like 300 units in one building, and there are I don't know how many buildings over there, that you can have multiple apartments being vacant and being put up for sale. And how do you get in touch with all those people that may apply for all of those different apartments? I think that puts a strain, you know, on, a, on these middle-income co-ops. And on limited equity cooperatives, um, while I've had some issues with what HPD wants to do with the regulatory agreements, I have concerns of how these limited equity cooperatives would manage this legislation. If they're having trouble managing their buildings and HPD wants to do this um, regulatory agreement to have a clearer oversight and, and clear indicators of financial mismanagement. How do we get them to do all the paperwork? I think it does become burdensome. And I want, and my question will be is, do you agree that this would become burdensome for limited equity cooperatives and, and as well as um, middle income and even um, no clear boundaries for even cooperatives that have good financial standing and are high income individuals. I'm afraid I can't speak to um, the, the level of burdensomeness on, on, on co-ops and of co-ops of varying size. Um, that is not a... Sorry, uh, maybe HPD oh, might be able to. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. So HPD does not have the power to intervene in cases like these, so we would direct them to the Human Rights Commission. Um, I mean, part of yeah. the problem... I, I think the council but, member's but, question was, but the part, would it be burdensome? Not you, whether you, you guys are going to have some oversight under your proposals. Um, you would have um, uh, oversight over who the management would be, and it has to be a third-party manager. Wouldn't that put an extra burden on the limited equity cooperatives as well as on HPD, because um, you would have to give the cooperatives guidance and some structure and oversight. I mean, part of, part of the problem is that we have very limited 
supervising ability right now, so our visibility is very limited. So, so I know that all too well. Right, right. So I think that hinders my ability to answer your question accurately, but I'm happy to get back to you. Okay, I think you've answered the question for me at least. I feel co confident what the answer is. There would be a big burden, but you know, differing minds could come to a different conclusion on that. Thank you very much. Is, um, I'm sorry, is there anything that you would like to add from the commissioner? No, I, I'll let my colleague at HPD take that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I do want to say one, I just appreciate the, the discussion that's going on, and I think it's thoughtful. I do want to separate out two different things that I thought I've been hearing. One is uh, skepticism if this type of discrimination is actually happening in a meaningful way uh, from the way the bills are trying to get it, at it, and the burden that it will cause. So the first one is just there's no doubt in my mind that there is this type of discrimination that is occurring. And for the other two, as I've said before and my colleague said, if there are other, there are other tools that people think we should be using, I'm happy to hear them. Um, in the absence of that, we have decided that these tools are helpful. And maybe now that we're more serious, there might be some other options that come, but they, they haven't come so far. <clears throat> I will say that every time we discuss discrimination and pathways to try to fix it, these, there are similar arguments that occur all of the time. Not, not some of the time, not once in a while. All of the time it is a, a question of is it just bad actors? Is it a few people? Is it a sledgehammer we're using? It's going to be overburdensome. Same thing with the Fair Chance Act, uh, the Bandit Box. These, these are always what repeatedly comes in. We've always actually found that it hasn't been overly burdensome. It wasn't a sledgehammer, and it was more than just a few bad apples. Um, so, but I do want to say, because I represent a lot of co-ops as well, and, and for us, my bill, I, I'm always happy to talk about how to make it better. Um, Perhaps the time issue is one that was written, could be something to look at, but it seems to me that to say that it's burdensome to provide any, the answer to providing any timeline is infinitum, or you can just, you can just keep it as long as you want. That seems like that's absurd. <laughs> so my um, hope is that there is a way that we can discuss this in a way that is uh, between what we're, we're looking for and absurdness, is, which, is, which is what we have right now. So uh, I'm gonna go to Council Member Lander, for three minutes and Councilman Rosenthal for three minutes. Thank you, Chair Williams. And I, I did just feel the need to underscore like what, what's being called burdensome is get letting, writing people a letter or a postcard within 45 days to let them know about a decision and when you decline someone explaining the reasons why. That's what we're calling the death. And you don't have to prove that you did those things proactively or file an annual report. It's just if someone makes a complaint that they were discriminated against, you'd have to show that you had done it. And if you hadn't done it, you might be vulnerable to a discrimination complaint. If that's too burdensome to protect New Yorkers from discrimination in the cooperative marketplace, I don't know what would not be. And honestly, unfortunately, the only other thing I've heard here is we could give them the commission's phone number. Like that's the only other solution so far that has been proposed. Uh, so one question is, in the rental marketplace, is it the vast majority of rental owners that discriminate that you find, you know, I mean, they, uh, We couldn't, I mean, we, we couldn't prosecute our way out of that problem. You have a very small right? percentage of rental yes. owners, in which case there is discrimination. And we don't say, well, let's just stop worrying about discrimination in the rental marketplace because only a small percentage of owners do it, do we? Certainly not. Okay, and I don't think we should do it in the cooperative marketplace either. I grant the vast majority of cooperative owners do not discriminate, but a small percentage do, and we ought to provide some protections, and this thing being called a burden is a, is a tiny, tiny burden. Again, write people a postcard in 45 days and explain the reasons. So one thing is, what are reasons that would be discriminatory to dis decline someone in a co for a co-op? Again, I, I a few examples. I can't imagine. So, again, I can't imagine that a, a disclosure requirement would get at would identify discriminatory motivation. So, I think that the disclosure requirement and, and well, that wasn't what I asked. What are reasons sure. that would be discriminatory to decline someone's application? If someone was motivated, at, even at least in part, based on one's membership in a protected group, which is you know over a dozen different categories in the in the housing protections. So would it be discriminatory to say you didn't have the financial uh, you know wherewithal needed to purchase the apartment? 
On its face, no, but if someone was being held to a different standard because of their membership in a protected group. Exactly. So, and would it be discriminatory to say, we, you know, past people you lived with said you were terrible to live with? Would that be discriminatory? Not on its face, no. but again, if being held to a different standard. Exactly. So all you'd have to do if you weren't holding people illegally to a different standard is explain one of these very many, and I could probably come up with 25 more totally reasonable reasons you could write on your postcard and send it to the person. And so long as you had not actually discriminated against people based on them being a member of a protected class, would you have anything to worry about under this law? Like, you would not. Likely not. However, the law actually doesn't require that there be discrimination. So um, I think you had um, stated a, a little earlier that if someone brought a claim of discrimination to the commission, then we would look at these documents. But if you don't, the law, the, the proposed legislation doesn't actually require that. So the commission would have, and then there'd be also be a private right of action here as well, so someone could go to, to state court. But the commission would have jurisdiction over the timing and form of these disclosures, whether or not discrimination occurred. So sure. there's that penalty schedule and everything laid out in the proposed bill. So, that so everyone... even if there was not discrimination, the commission, as proposed, the commission would have the authority to so investigate So you've identified on one issue Councilmember Williams already agreed to work on, but I think you've also articulated why this would be such sensible legislation to have. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Cohen for three minutes each. So um, can you explain what you were just saying again? I'm not a lawyer. So you're saying that under the bill, you would bring a cause or something if they didn't meet the letter of the law, which is to send out a postcard within five days so, with right. something like, you know, didn't meet the financial requirements. And that's what you could, you know, I never got a postcard and then you would go after that person, that building. Right, so the, the framework that's set out in the two bills um, would provide people with either a pride of right of action so they could go to state court or they could come to the commission based on failure to comply with the um, disclosure report and reporting, or I, I would, I'll call it a disclosure requirement, um, both the timing and the form of the, of the disclosure. Right, but what about content? Because then everyone will just have pre made postcards with five quote unquote legitimate reasons and they'll just check some things and everyone will get a postcard, then what's the value of addressing real discrimination in doing these, if they're so easy, actions? Right, I think that is one of the challenges that we have at the commission in um, in taking on these kinds of cases. Our cases are, and our, and our workflow, and our, uh, the, the attorney's work is focused on assessing whether discrimination occurred. This would actually be separate and apart from that. The, I, I understand the need I to- I mean, I guess my question is, what can we do in the law to make it valuable to you so that you could be identifying a real problem. It doesn't strike me that what's in here allow, gives you the bandwidth, you know, it's a nice cover and says, you know, look, we're doing something about discrimination, but if we really wanted to do something about discrimination, it sounds like it's not this, what is it? I mean, what tools do you need to really go after discrimination? I think we can have a whole separate um, conversation about about that. I, I, I do think that transparency in the process is helpful. Um, I don't sure. know if um, if this is the way to do it. Um, but I, I agree that these co-op cases are incredibly challenging. They are similar, in fact, to failure to hire cases in employment where w someone is has a very limited amount of information because they're not in the workplace or they're not in the housing um, you know, unit or the, or the building to see the discriminatory activity happen or to, to be um, witness to it. So these are people are operating with an absence of information, and I know that that is frustrating and, um, and challenging, and, and so these cases are hard, and I, I think we're committed to, to trying to think creatively about ways to make the process more transparent to give people more tools. Um, but I don't disagree with you in the fact that I'm not sure this will give 
the commission the information it would need necessarily to move forward. Um, and again, this would not, um, on its face, we would get these documents and we would just be, we would just be checking that they met the requirements of the bill. We would not be necessarily going, digging deeper um, if someone didn't come with a uh, connected uh, claim um, or, you know, allegation of discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with the ban the box legislation has the instances of people filing complaints against employee discrimination gone up since the bill has been passed? Uh, the, on the Fair Chance Act? Yes. Yes, um, yes significantly. Uh, so significantly. How, how much was it before? Well, um, I have, I just have our 2016 annual report with us, but, um, so I don't have comparison data on the Fair Chance Act, but um, the, the numbers have climbed from 2015 to 2016, and I anticipate they will um, be reflect, an increase will be reflected in the 2017 data as well. And, I mean, I don't know if it would be labeled insignificant before, um, but based on what you're saying, there's been a significant increase, which could parallel the type of increase that can happen once we pass these bills and give people a, a larger opportunity is one. And two, with that bill, we didn't make discrimination illegal. It was already illegal. What we did was put a mechanism in which there was some kind of trigger that someone can say, I have now been discriminated against. Same with the co-op bills that we have here. We're not making something illegal, but there is no trigger that, that nothing to, to, to cause a light switch to go off because right now there don't have to be any response at all. And so we believe putting a trigger in will help uh, someone say, okay, now that this is triggers here, this hasn't happened, or this such and such happens, I may have been discriminated on, and now could make more complaints come to CHR. I say that because, again, I just want to remind every time that we try to do something like this, the same type of complaints um, go up. But what we find is once it's done, it is very beneficial. And so I'm into um, trying to see how we can make these uh, bills reflect to what's actually on the ground with co-op owners, but saying that we, we do nothing and keep it the way it is, which is what I sound like a lot of what I'm hearing, um, it's, it's just not the, the way to go and not the answer. So. I have a response to that, actually, if you want. Oh. Third round. Sure. <laughs> Councilman Williams. Um, Councilman Williams, I really appreciate what you're saying. And I appreciate where it comes from, a oh, thousand percent. Um, and I, I really thought I made that clear in my comments. We need something. I'm not sure this is the something. And, you know, I'm spitballing, but would it be, you know, if, if finances are the biggest issue for a cooperative, right, should be the biggest issue of an incoming um, owner, the thing you really should care about is can you sustain your apartment and sustain payment to the cooperative? Um, is there something where, and maybe this is for the Department of Finance, but where um, if, if that would be a required question that you would put to all prospective buyers, you know, what are your financials, and then you just submit to the DOF or an appropriate agency, you know, here are the list of financials for all the people who applied, and then circle the one you chose. And that's it. And that, maybe it goes to you. And then the trick, you know, somehow that in, with privacy in mind, that something else be a trigger. I just wanted, I partially say that to demonstrate to you, let's, let's think creatively about a good solution. I'm not sure what's on the table is it, but is it. But please walk away knowing that I, I'm determined to get to a solution just like you. Um, but I don't want to falsely make people feel like we just took care of discrimination, we can walk away from this, when we didn't. It's a serious problem and it needs a serious solution. Um, so, so I just want to make, uh, I'm with you. It's just, I'm not sure it's this. Thank Chair, you. Chair um, Williams, can I ask one more question? All right, hold on. <laughs> one. Of the, of the witness, sure. not a debate. Um, and I thank you for that comment. I definitely want to um, continue the conversation and we will. I have uh, a few questions I'm going to ask one, and then I'm going to allow Councilman Rolando to ask his one, 
We're going to have a couple more on J51, and then we're going to call it quits for the time being. Um, does the commission provide any guidance to co-op boards regarding discrimination concerns? Um, we do um, outreach and education to housing providers of all types. So we provide um, what we call Know Your Obligations um, trainings and workshops, and we do specific ones for housing providers. So, so yes, we don't have specific written guidance, um, but we provide um, education and presentations and workshops to associations, to essentially anyone who, who asks, and we do a host of outreach on that as well. Thank you. Okay, I have some J51 questions, but I'm going to go into a fourth round here. So we have <laughs> Councilmember Landon and Councilmember Cohen, two minutes each. Hopefully, it's one question. Um, so you and, and others here have kind of questioned the value of this, and I, I guess what I want to just ask and make clear is, it, isn't a basic principle of anti-discrimination work that you often prove your case by showing pretext, the offering of false reasons? Don't, aren't you in a lot better shape in proving discrimination if it existed if someone gave a false reason than if someone gave no reason at all? I think... I, I mean, again, we're, we're talking in hypotheticals. Um, well, I'm talking generally here about anti-discrimination work. Absolutely. Isn't that a common thing you would, you would, you would investigate, is very, the offering of a false reason? Very few people will openly admit to a civil enforcement agency that they have discriminated against someone based on a protected category. So, yes, we deal, deal with pretext and mixed motive cases all the time. What, would you rather begin an investigation with the possibility of investigating a false reason, a pretext, or would you rather begin an investigation where someone had, didn't have to say anything at all? I, in general, not in relationship to this bill. I think generally we would, we would work with the, we would start with the proffered reason. So if the proffered reason was pretextual, we would start with that reason and we would work to determine if that was legitimate, if that was credible, or if it was uh, put forth as a way to mask underlying discrimination. So, I mean, just being straight on this, again, putting the bill aside, I mean, so what you're saying is, you would certainly, if there was discrimination, you think you'd have a better case, a better chance of proving it if a false reason were offered than if the person had never offered a reason and didn't have to. I think that's what you just said. I think if we had a proffered reason, that would be a, a very good place to start and sort of a cross-examination so of the that. Witness. I would just say is the entire point of this bill. We have nothing. This would get us a proffered reason. You just said a proffered reason was valuable, and still no one has offered anything else. So I would just say to my colleagues, this is a minor burden, and it's not nothing. It's actually something that the deputy commissioner just said strengthens your ability to prove discrimination. I, Thank I think you, Mr. our Chair. I think our concern, though, is that this would be an unprecedented um, mechanism that the commission would be regulating. I, I in take that your point about be... timeline. I, I think the chair said this too. I think your point that the timeline requirements with no allegation of discrimination is unusual to have sit at the, at the commission. I, I take your point on that. The chair said it was something that, that we would look at together after the hearing. Uh, Councilmember Coleman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I will just make the point. I think that the proffered reason becomes no reason if it's if it's going to be a standardized form in which boxes are going to be checked. We rejected you for these three reasons, and it's going to be industry-wide, and it's, that will ultimately be no reason at all. Uh, first of all, and I just want to also make it clear that I think that I'm I'm concerned about the other side of the equation. The purchaser never walks away and says, you know what, that board was right. I really am not financially qualified to live in this building. It's going to just give a, you know, having a document has the potential of I'm going to go to Supreme Court. I'm going to pressure these people into yielding to letting me in whether I have the financial wherewithal to be in this building or not because, out of fear of litigation. I don't think that's the way to proceed. And again, I think that that is the burden that I'm very concerned about. Not, it's not the four corners of the bill. It's ultimately opening a Pandora's box to, to litigation uh, against these co-ops, which I do, do think does actually threaten their ability to do what they're uh, chartered to do. So that's really what my concern is on these legislation. And again, I don't think I asked a question, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Last question from Councilmember Gordon. Last, well, I, ju I just want to say that you're going to hear in a few minutes from people who will speak much more eloquently about, uh, as, as my colleague Mr. Cohn said, the Pandora's box that we, we would be opening here. And I know from working with the over 20,000 co-ops and condos in my district, the burden that has been placed on them by uh, runaway property taxes by the city, which has nothing to do with, with uh, the Human Rights Division, but has everything to do with the city of New York. 
and I am worried that this will create an undue burden on people that are not doing anything wrong. They're just trying to provide housing for, for middle-income uh, people. So uh, we're going to hear from some very smart people in a little while that are going to testify, but I just wanted to, to uh, associate myself with, with Mr. Cohn's remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, with J51, how many buildings currently receive J51 benefits? So there, so I'm going to give you the numbers for co-ops, uh, for the entire co-op, because that's like the, the tax lot, the tax entity, and then for condos for the condo unit. So there's uh, 611 condo development, uh, co-op developments, and uh, 19,038 condo units receiving J51. Is there an estimate for how many will receive J51 benefits when the assessed value eligibility limit is increased? Um, yes, uh, we, we estimate that uh, about a dozen co-ops, uh, co-op co buildings, um, and about 200 co uh, condo units would utilize this benefit at the expanded AV level. How is the cost of living adjustment percentage calculated, and what is the typical value? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How is the cost of living adjustment percentage calculated, and what is the typical value? Um, the, the cost of living adjustment is, is, uh, is spelled out in both state law and in the local enabling legislation, and it, and it um, references a federal cost of living adjustment, and it's going to be, uh, we calculate that it will be around 2% a year, roughly. How much does the program currently cost, and what is the expected cost to the city with the increase of the eligibility limit? Eligibility limit? So the, the current tax expenditure for the program is $287 million, and we expect that the increased tax expenditure uh, fr resulting from this expansion is going to be uh, $1.4 million in the first year, uh, $2.4 million in the second year, and $3.6 million in the third year. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, actually, I appreciate all the discussion we had here from uh, all of my colleagues, and I hope we would take it back and come up with something that makes sense for everybody because I don't think we can go on without addressing the issue. But I appreciate uh, the testimony and I trust that someone from the administration is going to remain uh, for the duration of the hearing so that we can hear the rest of the conversation. Am I correct in that assumption? All right, thumbs up. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, next panel, uh, Jeffrey Mazel, Mazel from the President, uh, President's Co-op and Condo Council. Robert Frederick, President's Co-op and Condo Council. Warren Schreiber, President's Co-op and Condo Council. Michael Kurtz, President, Co-op and Condo Council. And the next panel, next and last panel, after this panel will be David Tipson, New York Appleseed, Marion Rothman, Council of uh, New York, New York Corporations and Condominiums, Fred Friedberg, or Freeberg, I'm sorry, Fair Housing Justice Center, Craig Gurian, Fair Play Legislation, and Barbara Ford, New York State Association of Realtors. They will be on the next panel. Please get ready when this panel is complete. Thanks. <laughs> May each please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. I do. You'll each have two minutes to give your testimony, and you can each begin in the order of your preference. Hold one second, I'm sorry. Okay, you can begin. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Um, okay, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Williams and uh, committee members. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition of intro 1458 and intro 1467. I currently serve as co-president of the President's Co-op and Condo Council, which represents more than 70 properties in Queens with a population of approximately 100,000 residents. Mr. Schreiber, just for the record, can you please say your name? Oh, sure. War uh, Warren Schreiber. That's S-C-H-R-E-I-B-E-R. -E okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, population of uh, 100,000 residents. In addition, for the past 18 years, I have been serving as the president of Bay Terrace Cooperative Section 1. Most sales interviews are conducted within 10 days 
of a membership application being submitted. During my 18-year tenure as president, rejected applications can be counted on one hand. The rejections in all instances were based on financial disqualification. Intro 1458 and Intro 1467 will make it more difficult and in some instances impossible for struggling middle class families and individuals on fixed incomes to achieve the goal of ownership in a cooperative housing development. In order to protect the corporation, its shareholders and board of directors, Bay Terrace Cooperative Section 1 have, has resolved to adopt the following policies upon the passage of Intro 1458 or Intro 1467. Intro 1467, concerning the timing of decisions for sales of cooperative apartments. Any and all sales applications for cooperative apartments that for any reason cannot be acted upon within 25 days after being received by Bay Terrace Cooperative Section 1 will be rejected. This policy, this policy will be strictly adhered to. Intro 1458, concerning the sales of cooperative apartments. Extreme vetting measures for all applicants and, other reside, and others residing in the apartment will be put into place. Private investigators will be retained to perform exhaustive background checks. The corporation's legal counsel will be present at all interviews. All interviews will be video recorded. Applicants will be provided to provide certified tax returns, which can take 45 to 60 days to obtain. Financial requirements must be met. There will be no financial forgiveness. Can I have to ask you to give a closing sentence? Yes. Okay. Um, the additional costs associated with these measures are going to be passed on to the applicant. So many applicants who are right on the financial threshold, they will no, be, no longer to be able to afford this housing. Affordable housing will stop being affordable. And also, just lastly and really importantly, I want to question the City Council's authority and their jurisdiction to put into place this type of legislation because, as you know, we are authorized to act under state business corporate law. And this legislation would be changing our business model. Thank you. We'll, have, we'll be doing some interaction okay, now. Okay, and I could see that going to court. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeffrey Maisel, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Is the, mic the mic's not on. Is that better? Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Maisel, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak before the council on this extremely important issue. By way of background, I'm a practicing attorney for over 30 years, and I represent over 100 call from condo boards, representing over 12,000 units of co-op housing. I'm chairperson of the Queens Bar Association Call for Condo Committee and legal advisor to the President's Council. And one other qualification I need to mention is I was actually rejected by a co-op board. As a young law student, I was um, applying for a co-op in Brooklyn and was rejected. So I do have experience on both sides of this issue. In addition, I represent buyers and sellers and, and shareholders alike. So um, my vantage point is, is vast experience and from all sides of the issue. I'd also like to uh, just put on the record that myself, Mr. Schreiber, and several groups from uh, the brokers, uh, NISAR, did meet with Mr. Germani, Councilman Germani. We did meet with your office, uh, an extensive meeting. Uh, Mr. Toomey took copious notes, and I suggest you look at them, and we'd be more than willing to meet again to come to some sort of uh, meeting of the minds, if possible, if not, um, that, so be it, but please, uh, we did meet with you, and, and not one suggestion that was made was included in this legislation. Um, I'm going to go off my uh, testimony, uh, my, my uh, written testimony for a second, just to address certain issues that were raised. A profit reason is an invitation for a lawsuit. There's no reason for it. It serves no purpose, because once a human rights claim is filed, uh, you have to give a reason at that point, and that's the time and place that such a reason should be made. In addition, I heard um, several of the councilmen talk about the simple statement that has to be submitted where you check a box on a postcard. I, 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 I ask you to read 
8-1202 and what is required to be submitted when rejecting an applicant for a co-op, it is a sophisticated document that's going to require legal expertise because any reason that's not included in there, you're, you're barred, you're time limited from giving a reason, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're cannot give a reason thereafter. And finally, and the most important issue, is the punitive measures of this, of this statute are an insult to the co-op and condo community. Um, no one mentioned it from the city council today. Please read the punitive measures. You, they are expensive. Uh, I don't know any other law where if you're one day late in submitting a document, you have a five, you're subject to a $5,000 to $25,000 penalty. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for the opportunity to give testimony today. My name is Michael Kurtz. I'm treasurer of the President's Co-op and Condo Council and president of Clearview Gardens Corporation's Co-op, a garden apartment complex comprising of 1,788 units. Allow me to explain how the interview process works at Clearview Gardens. When the prospective purchaser first comes to the office, they have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the administrator, at which time they are given the application, which lists all the requirements. The administrator then explains each one. When the prospective purchaser is returned with the completed application, it is again reviewed in its entirety, and any missing documentation is pointed out, and an interview is scheduled pending receipt of whatever was missing. Any missing documentation is subsequently brought in, and the administrator issues an OK that we can proceed with the interview at the scheduled date and time. This will no longer be the case. The proposed legislation will impact the process as the co-op must send written notification of what is, this, what is missing. When the prospective purchaser has acquired the documentation, they provide it to the co-op who must then document what was provided and that all is in order again and document what is still required. The co-op has 10 days to provide each one of these responses. Um, attend the written form, what is needed, each documentation is provided. 45 days can slip by pretty quickly if I have 10 days at each time. We, con we conduct interviews the second and fourth Monday of each month. We hold board meetings the second and fourth Tuesday of each month, except for July, US, and December. After the interview committee meets with the prospective purchaser, a recommendation is decided on. The committee has three options, approval, request additional information, or denial. The recommendation is then brought before the board the following evening, and the full board votes on the recommendation. Our attorney is informed on the decision the following Wednesday and immediately notifies the prospective purchaser. The prospective purchaser is notified within two days of the interviews. Not much room for improvement. On those months where the board has only one meeting, they grant the president the authority to act on their behalf on approvals. Many years ago, we noticed a phenomenon where prospective purchasers had sold their homes for various reasons. Children moved away. They tired of mowing lawns and shoveling snow. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to have a closing, closing sentence. Okay. In closing, this will make it more restrictive for us to approve people because now we have a time limit. We have to give reasons. It, 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 it's detrimental to the people who are trying to buy in, in our opinion. Thank you. My name is Bob Friedrich. I'm president of Glen Oaks Village, the largest garden apartment co-op in New York. It is home to 3,000 working class families, many who are city workers. An important point to keep in mind is that we're in the business of bringing folks into our residential communities, not keeping them out. I'm also co-president of the President's Co-op and Condo Council, a think tank of co-op board presidents that represent almost 100 co-ops. Let me begin by emphatically stating what you already probably know. There is absolutely no data supporting the allegation of systemic discrimination in residential co-ops. Doesn't exist. Law should be written to rectify proven problems and not written based upon hunches, assumptions, or feelings. These two bills are a solution in search of a problem and they need to be rejected. Ending perceived discrimination in co-op housing is the reason these two bills have been proposed. So let me here and now lay to rest the idea that discrimination is pervasive in co-op housing. For it to exist, the following extraordinary events would all have to take place simultaneously. One, co-op owners would have to elect a majority of inherently dishonest individuals to their board. Two, 
A typical board of nine would require five colluding board members to break the law and discriminate. Three, the co-op management company would have to be part of the law-breaking collusion. And four, all of these colluding individuals would have to bring the co-op attorney into the ring of collusion in order to achieve an unlawful denial. This scenario simply does not happen. The elaborate hierarchy of checks and balances among these individuals, all of whom have a fiduciary responsibility to the co-op to act in a lawful and proper manner, is the reason that there is no data to support systemic discrimination in housing co-ops. So in summary, numerous and redundant safeguards to ensure that co-op applicants receive the fullest protection of the law and the ability to defend themselves against real discrimination already exists. These two bills will add nothing to that equation, but will simply make it more difficult and, expe and expensive for pro prospective applicants to purchase a cooperative apartment. They need to be rejected. <sighs> Thank you. Um, I, I found this amazing, because um, we have a panel of probably the least diverse <laughs> representation of the co-ops ended by someone who's telling us that discrimination just simply doesn't exist in co-ops and condos. Glen Oaks Village is probably one of the most diverse No, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, sir. Um, it your does, statement, the data sir, sir, the data sir, 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 I'm chairing the hearing. Thank you. Okay. Um, your statement in particular gave a breakdown of why discrimination does not occur in co-ops and condos. Yours in particular. I don't know the breakdown of your co-op or condo. I do know for a fact that discrimination does occur. And the breakdown you gave made it seem like that we have to have some CIA or Kremlin-like uh, intelligence to be able to discriminate in co-op and condo purchase. That's absurd. Like, I don't even know what to, like, I'm gonna start from there because all of the testimony wasn't as absurd as that. I found out the most absurd to say that we cannot discriminate in housing unless we have some CIA intelligence to craft together a procedure and we should do so. That should be rejected on its face. Actually, that wasn't what I said. What I, I, I would, uh, maybe I misread, maybe I misunderstood your, your statement. And if I did, I apologize. But what it sounded like you said, in order for discrimination to occur, you gave a list of things that would have to happen that seemed insurmountable. Did I hear that wrong? In order for discrimination to exist in a co-op that has a board of directors would require the collusion of a majority of board members. And uh, with all due respect, although you think it exists, the data simply does not support your allegation of systemic sure. discrimination in cooperative housing. Okay, let me just withdraw my apology because I didn't hear you incorrectly. I just want, I did absolutely heard you correctly and what you're insinuating is that no discrimination no exists. No systemic No, no, hold on. I know what I heard and you repeated it and it's absurd on its face. Now, I do want to get into discussions after my colleagues about whether or not we have the appropriate tools to address that discrimination. It's hard to discuss whether we have the appropriate tools if there are people who believe it doesn't even exist. I don't know what your definition of systemic, but most of the bills that we pass here dealing with discrimination is not for the vast majority of people who aren't discriminating. It is for the people who are, period. So maybe you have not experienced it, but I'm here to tell you that it does exist. And it's not even a question on a, a, a argumentable, I'm not, I'm not gonna have the back and forth. Okay. On its face value, that portion of your testimony was absurd. Just I'm going to move forward to Council Member uh, Lander for three minutes of questioning, Council Member Rosenthal, and Council Member um, So my first question is whether the four of you are aware that Suffolk County and the village of Hempstead have legislation very, very similar to what's proposed here. And if you are, are you aware? I mean, I have not seen evidence that there's massive litigation, that people have stopped refusing, started refusing to serve on co-op boards, or that any Pandora's box has been opened. And it, I, I suspect you guys would know if it had. So are you aware of that? And, and have I missed the fact that the Pandora's box was if, opened uh, by so it? If so if I may, Council Member, I don't think that there can be a comparison made between New York City 
and Nassau County or Suffolk County. I mean, even when you go into the state, it always talks about cities with a population of a million or more. There's only well, one there's of no us. There's no co-ops with and population of a only, million or more. There's only one of us. And where I'm from in Queens, uh, we have a population of almost two and a half million people. The, the and that's co-ops what kind of, are of similar size. So anyway, I guess, so well, if, were, were any of you, let me start there, were any of you aware that Suffolk County and the village of Hempstead have very similar legislation? Yeah, yes, we're aware of it. Um, and are you aware it, of it, it having it, caused big problems? I, I'm not aware of Thank any, you. any problems. I don't have However, uh, there's 11,000 clubs and condos in Suffolk County. This organization represents 100,000. And the punitive measures that you put in here are, are not in those, is not in that litigation. And that's got to be reconsidered because they are extraordinarily high numbers, penalizing uh, boards, which penalize the shareholders. So the people you're trying to protect are going to get hurt oh. also. So, but you guys aren't aware. I mean, so it's only 11,000, but if it had caused massive Pandora's box, anyway, you aren't aware of any significant problems having been caused by the Suffolk or the well, we haven't spoken legislation. Let me move on to my second well, I'm, I'm question. I have, because I actually, I'm Mr. trying to Friedrich, answer your question. But I'm going to move on to a different question for you. So, okay. my question for you, just so you're clear, is the law doesn't presume systemic or pervasive discrimination. The law is to be able to root out discrimination when and where it occurs. So, I'm going to give you a chance to clarify. Are you saying that no discrimination occurs in New York City cooperatives? No. I, I, I you think my, it does occur? I base my statements on data. Can you show me data that shows I'm asking, this is, the way this works is that I get to ask the questions. If you want to run for council, you can do that. But till then, I get to ask the questions. I, I'm not, look, I don't believe there's systemic or pervasive discrimination. I think do you, you are. Are you bad, arguing that, that no discrimination I'm occurs? I'm going to answer your question. I think there may be some bad apples, okay? There are bad apples in every, in, in, in every facet of, of life. Okay, so that's great that we actually have some common ground. You agree some discrimination occurs, and we're proposing some modest legislation to try to make sure that when it occurs, those people have the ability to do something about it. Um, I'm going to come to Bay Terrace just because I think you actually helped me understand how easy this would be to comply with. You said that you've only had a handful of rejections. <clears throat> I'm assuming they were not based on discrimination, and that they were based on uh, people's income or uh, financial wherewithal. Is that correct? In every single instance, that's correct. They were based on uh, financial. They were not able so, to meet our financial requirements. So you understand all we're asking is for you to have written a letter to those people saying you lack the financial wherewithal. But that's, but that, but that's actually not, uh, Councilman, with all due respect, that's not what the, um, uh, what the uh, legislation uh, says. It says that we have to give you um, actually asking for a, um, a, a statement, and I believe it... Um, it uh, said it was a, um, a certified statement. So it shall include a certification by an officer of the cooperative corporation sworn or affirmed under penalties of perjury that the statement is true, complete and specific recitation. That is a lot different than You know that you swore in box, this sir. morning when you came to sit on this panel. I mean, you, the, the council member swore you in. All a sworn or a firm statement is is that a member of the co-op board give the reason and, and say it's true and, not, and that it's not false. Sure, but as, a, but, as, but as a volunteer board member, um, I am now and my other board members, we are putting ourselves in legal liabilities. It is a very litigious, um, lit litigious but just uh, society no more so than that we live in. you coming today to testify. People sue for anything. So if we have to put this in writing, that is very, very problematic for us. Now, or, Help also, me understand let me, why, if it's also, true, why you. would it be problematic? Also, Thank you, Council Member. Also, when, when you're talking about um, the um, applicant, someone's in it says the applicant uh, being able to correct any deficiencies that um, may take place. So if we reject somebody because their, um, uh, their financials are $20,000, $25,000 short, and now we have to give them an opportunity to make that up. First of all, it's, it, it is you almost... to give them an opportunity to make it up. That's just not in the law. No, it's not. Mr. Schreiber, you can just finish your statement. Okay, Thank that's you, what the legislation says. Oh, it isn't. Uh, Councilman Branda. Uh, that's Brenda, just false, But sir. also, what happens is during that time, it puts the sale <laughs> of that apartment in limbo, so the... The seller, they cannot move forward because now they're waiting for the buyer to make right, just not correct. Thank you, Mr. You're saying things thank that are you. not in the law. All right, I might need a second question to ask sure. about extreme vetting. Okay, Mr. thank you. Um, Mr. Frederick, uh, your, your statement and others have mentioned about bad apples. 
that gets repeated every single time we do discrimination, policing, housing, it's always just a few bad, uh, bad apples. At some point, there's a bushel, and I don't know what that is, but I'm tired of hearing all the damn bad apples that exist that doesn't result in actual discrimination. So we, at some point, have to get off this stupid bad apples thing and saying that there is a problem that we have to address. Now, I'm willing to say we have to have the appropriate tools to do that, but we always have to get to the bad apple part, and there's always people who are not doing those things, and maybe if those people who are doing those things would call out those apples a little bit better or self correct themselves, we wouldn't have to do it. But that doesn't happen, yeah. particularly when there's people like you saying that there's not even discrimination that is occurring, which is what you originally testified. But if you're going to change your testimony, I'm willing to hear it. But what you originally said is there, a bar, there is a bar so insurmountable that it would be almost impossible for a co-op or condo board to discriminate. Yes. And that, that's just, that lends me to believe that you don't even want to acknowledge Mr. a Mr. problem, so it's hard to fix that. M Mr. Williams. Yes, Mr. Frederick. I, 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 under, I, I understand what you're saying, but we generally make laws here based upon data, not based upon your, humption, your hunches, your assumptions, or your feelings. Mm -hmm. I understand what you feel and what you think, but that is absolutely not supported by data, and you know that. You're sitting here and you know that. You know there is absolutely no data that shows any systemic discrimination in housing co-ops. You had the Human Rights Commission here mm -hmm. tell you, tell you at this meeting, that it was basically infinitesimal, the number of allegations of discrimination in co-ops. And by the way, people can come to the Human Rights Commission any time to make a claim. And once they make a claim, the burden of proof is not on them to prove discrimination, but is the burden of proof is on the co-op to prove that they did not discriminate. Sure. You, so you, you're, you, so, so sure. you, you we, also we heard the, H the Human Rights and Commission, and you also heard them say uh, the, I think her word uh, was exponential increase in discrimination claims when we passed the Fair Chance Act. So if we had this conversation before, your line of argument may have also existed. We would not have done it and we would not have gotten to where we are today. You also heard her mention that they don't get too many complaints about mortgage-related discrimination, even though they have the authority of it. Do you agree that there has been mortgage discrimination? Of course there has been. Okay. And you know why I agree? Because mm -hmm. I've seen the data to support that. Which data that. did you see? I've seen the data to support that. Where, where did you see it? Seen the data. Where did you see it? I've read about it. I've gone online. Okay. I've researched Most it. of that came about after people laws um, lost their homes, and people started to do research on the type of mortgages that they were being stared into. Uh, there was a lot of anecdotal information before that, and perhaps if there were some people who stepped in before that, this wouldn't have occurred. We have the same kind of anecdotal information now when it comes to co-ops and condos. We want to step in before that. Now, perhaps you don't know the people who are affected by this, so it doesn't matter if we step in, a, in, in it before or after, because you won't be affected, but many of us do. I, and I so we want, to, we, we want to respond to much of the information that we have heard in a way that is not overly burdensome. So I want to say I'm hearing uh, Mr. Mr. Mazel, Mr. Mazel uh, about the uh, punitive measures. It's not my bill, but I'd like to look at that. Uh, I know we did have a meeting. I want to go back and review that because I actually listen when people are saying things are going to be uh, overly burdensome, and I want to try to address that. That is different to me than someone saying there's nothing to address. Can I, I just, just want to be clear about it. i just expand on that one point. Uh, not only the punitive measures, there's legal fee provisions in here too, which opens up, and I'm a lawyer and I love legal fees, but it opens up a cottage industry for people to run out and get a lawyer who's going to sue co-ops to get you know, uh, nuisance cases because the co-ops are now exposed. So those are things that are counterproductive don't solve any problem and really need to be looked at. I hear you. Uh, the, the punitive measures thing is not my bill again, so my colleagues, but that has more weight to me than this because I've heard that I've heard about cottage industries uh, when, we, when I passed the bias based policing uh, bill. That hasn't occurred. I heard about cottage industry when we passed the Fair Chance Act. That hasn't occurred well, I, at I, all, I, even a little bit. I'm just the Fair Debt was, Collection Act, I've had experience okay. with that, and, and that has built a cottage industry. Okay. Lawyers suing. Uh, uh, other lawyers. Uh, and I, wanna, I do want to address a, a, an issue of how to fix a problem as opposed to no problem exists at all. That's just uh, where I'm coming from. I, there, I did have one question. It seemed that there's uh, some opposition to, let's pretend discrimination aside, that there's some opposition to setting a time frame of which people should be responded to. Why is there a, a particular objection to that? 
Um, well, the way these are written in the time framework uh, is, is not realistic. Um, we have met with NISAR, this group has met with NISAR and discussed reasonable time framework that may work s down the road. Um, in addition, uh, co-op contracts uh, do have a provision that if the board doesn't react within 30 days after the law date in the contract, the buyer may terminate the contract. So this notion that contracts go on forever and ever is not, is not true. So it's not necessary, I don't believe, in my opinion. I just um, think that the, the buyer, it, may, it, may, it, the buyer it, may, may terminate doesn't help them get in. Doesn't so, help them get in, but yeah. it helps them get out, out of the deal. I you got know, you. I, the, 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 the complaints I've heard, and I'm sure you'll hear testimony to this later, is that the co-op board holds it up so long that there's a negative effect on the parties involved, but there, yeah. is, there is contractual solutions too. Can I, can I add to that? Sure. Okay. The, uh, the time frames are so rigid in the legislation that what's going to happen, when I say rigid, rigid in, in the definitive time and that have to be certified letters going back and forth, that what's going to happen because the co-op is going to be so afraid of violating, as we said before, even one day, that what the co-op is going to do is basically say that if they don't have the full panoply of information in an application, they're just going to outright reject it, which is going to end up hurting applicants. Uh, so the, pro the problem is the rigidness in that time frame and the consequences of that. I know, you know, uh, the intentions were good, but it's going to create, and, and one other thing that it's going to do, uh, sometimes people who are applying for a co-op might need a little additional time because of a bank, you know, may need extra time or they may have to get their finances in order. In the past, a co-op was very flexible in working with them. Flexibility will be a thing of the past because a co-op will never treat one person different than another. In other words, if person A needed 10 more days for their bank uh, to approve uh, their application, we would not approve it because we would then be fearful that we would now be discriminate. We would be we would be sued for discrimination because we didn't provide that additional 10 days. So it's rigid. It's going to it's going to hurt those individuals that you're really trying to help, which those who are most vulnerable, who are trying to get into a co-op apartment. I do want to go back to some of those notes. I mean, I, I, in the rigidity, I, I want to welcome some more conversation. If, if folks have a discussion about how it could be less rigid and, and, and really get to what we're trying to get at. Uh, again, that's the difference in saying that there's no problem, so I want to have uh, that, that discussion. And then we're going to go to Council Member Rosenthal and Council Member Grudenchik. And I think there is a way to get there, by the way. Thank I you. Um, I, I actually am going to um, echo my colleague's comments by referring to Shakespeare. He thinks thou does protest too much. Um, you know, New York City is the most segregated city in the country because of choices that people have made. So, you know, there is a problem. That's not the question. The question is, how do we get at it in a meaningful way? I think something that would be helpful to uh, me, anyway. I mean, it sounds like my colleagues have done a lot of research on this already. But I challenge each of you to consider uh, uh, going to the, the last round of sales in each of your buildings, the last sale, most recent sale in your building. Redact the names, redact the dollar amounts, I'm not interested in address. I'm not interested in any single person's personal history. I'm interested to know what you wrote on that document and to see why it so thoroughly addresses what we're trying to get at. Is that something you would consider doing? Sure, if I, if I could answer that. Um... I, I, I certainly would, but it would be very boring because there's nothing that we ever write on the application. We're very... We're, so that tells I mean, me we're very, something we're, right we're, there. We're, we're, very, we're very cautious uh, about what we do with the okay. application. In, right, when the application... So turn in your boring document. It's a I just, boring all document. All I'm asking and it's just, is do you, would you feel comfortable turning in your most recent sale document? 
whatever you sent to the look I'm not in real estate so help me with the words but whatever you disclose to whoever you disclosed it to um, the that paperwork redacting any private personal information um, I, don't, Jeff, I, don't, I, don't I, I don't understand the question I, I don't I mean um, it's hard well, for me I'm not in real estate right, without, but without completely understanding the question I don't see um, <coughs> Well, help why, me understand why, why, where okay, you say. Okay, I don't see. I don't see why. Okay. We, why we so wouldn't. Let, but help me understand why you say that by turning in the document. Sure, that that, that wouldn't be that, that wouldn't be a problem. Can can I respond to that? Okay. Uh, in the last. And where I'm going is you you made this comment right at the end of your testimony with Councilmember Williams. What is the right way right. to get it? the answer to this question because we know by definition there is systemic discrimination against women, against people of color, against any disadvantaged group. That's why it's called a disadvantaged group, sure. right? And, and, and we know New York City is the most segregated city in the world. And, so and, what is the thing that we need to be looking at? Uh, let, let, me, let me just re re respond, to respond to that. I'm not here to, to do battle with you, with you guys, but a co-op is a very different entity than a rental apartment and a single-family home. Let me, let, let, let me uh, just so my, my words are not uh, misinterpreted. For a co-op application to be rejected by a board of directors, it does require a majority of the board to reject that, which means that if somebody was rejecting an application for a discriminatory reason is that the collusion among a majority. In Glen Oaks Village, we have reviewed over the last two years 232 applications, and we've done 232 interviews, and you know how many rejections we've had? Zero. Zero. Methinks We're thou dost protest too much. Council Member, thank you. We have uh, Council Member Grodenchik. For three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. I do want to say, firstly, before I, I ask some questions, I've had the pleasure of being at Glen Oaks Village on many occasions in my almost two years in the City Council. I was recently there at uh, Mr. Friedrich's invitation for the Fall Festival, the Fall Family Festival. Um, it's an incredible display of diversity. I think that perhaps of, of all the parts of my district, and it's certainly borne out by the population at PAD, P, uh, S, uh, I'm sorry, PS 186 Queens, which is uh, directly across the street from Glen Oaks and, and serves the children of Glen Oaks at uh, the grammar school level. That is the most diverse school that I have in my district. Um, you'd be walking into the United Nations if you walked into uh, that school. And um, I'm very uh, happy to have that. And I would welcome any of you, if you'd like to take a tour, I'm sure, Mr. Friedrich would be very happy to provide us with a tour of what is really a model of middle-class living um, in Eastern Queens. Um, and secondly, I don't think that um, anybody here, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we all understand that discrimination does occur, whether it's in uh, housing, uh, whether it's co-op or rental housing or, or, or single-family home sales, um, and we've all been stung with that um, on various occasions. I've heard the story of my father growing up in the Bronx about, you know, Signs in the windows in the streets of Bronx, United States, in the mid-30s, no Jews, no Irish need apply for jobs. So that's touched us all, but um, I am concerned that this legislation, as it's currently drafted, and I think that uh, the members of this panel who I have come to know over the years, I don't represent all of them, I only represent one of them, um, have worked very hard and are all volunteers with the exception of Mr. Maisel, um, but he doesn't charge too much. So, um, But I, I do want to ask this question which I think is very important and cuts to the heart of the matter, um, where we don't want to make this overly burdensome. And what I am concerned, and I'll ask this question to any of the three gentlemen, or mis maybe perhaps uh, Mr. Maisel, um, what kind of costs, additional costs, would you expect to have if this legislation, both of these pieces of legislation were passed into law? Um, how much more would that add to your bottom line or take away from your bottom line every year? Because we, I know that you work very, very hard to cut costs, and I know that um, you have worked very hard on the other piece of legislation that's here today, the J-51 um, exemption. So 
to anybody. Warren, you seem like you're reaching for the microphone. Yeah, I, I, I'm okay, right. So I'm not. I'm not sure that it would it would it would cut into the um, um, the um, the corporate bottom line. We may have some um, uh, you know additional cost as far as legal cost or the you know the attorney is on retainer. But I think that it would cut into the cost for the prospective purchaser that's because my second, we would that's have my to. That's my second question. Right, you. because we would have to put additional safeguards in place, and that might add. Uh, I've spoken to my property manager, and it could be anywhere as three to four thousand dollars additional for the application fee, which uh, to some families, middle class families, uh, people on fixed income, uh, that could be the difference between buying or not buying. Mr. Maisel, would you concur with that assessment? Yeah, because again, just again, their statement. The written statement that we discussed before is not a simple postcard where you check the boxes. That's not true at all. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated treatise that if you leave out a reason for a rejection, you can't bring it up later, and even in a discrimination case, you're barred from testifying to a different reason. So it's a, it, it's a sophisticated document that will probably need professional guidance and drafting. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know Mr. Kurtz. Did, okay. Thank you, Council Member. Um, of one, we were joined by Councilman Espinal Torres and now uh, Councilman McCornigy. I, I just want to be clear. Um, I don't know uh, uh, Glen Oaks. It could be most diverse. It could be a, the most diverse place in the country. It doesn't take back what I'm saying. And what we have a tendency to do is um, look at individual examples, uh, which are great because they can they do serve a purpose. But the more we go up to the bird's eye view is where we see the problem. And so, again, um, Mr. Fredericks, your testimony seemed to indicate that that problem is not that much. And in order for um, the discrimination to occur, they have to have some kind of collusion that's, you know, Trumpian like to, if they, in order for there to be a Russian collusion, the whole world had to, like, it's just this crazy, insurmountable uh, thing. Uh, and that's ridiculous. Like, so the, these, I don't, I don't think it's that hard to discriminate, um, as you mentioned. And some of the board members who are voting may not even be a part of whatever that is. They're just voting because they're part of the board. I don't know, but I do know your testimony negates a, a, a whole host of experiences that occur. Um, and I do just want to say, my, in terms of the bad apple things I've been hearing, the one thing that I think happened that is good uh, with uh, what happened last November in the ascension uh, of the orange man is that um, we now see that it's not just a few bad apples, that there are a lot of people who have come out of hiding who have had these issues for a very, very long time. And it flies in the face of all the people who said we were crazy because we were in a post-racial America. Uh, we know that we're not. And so hopefully uh, we can just acknowledge that to begin to move forward and stop going back to this, oh, it's just some bad apples and we are the ones that are over-exaggerating or exaggerating and overreacting. In government, we have to step in because these things don't correct themselves um, without some attention. We do have to step in carefully because um, we don't want to, uh, I guess overstep is the right word, we don't want to make it overly burdensome. And so I found that we are very careful in trying to weigh out addressing the issues that we know are real, even when people are telling us they're not real, and making sure that we're not harming the particular industry. Well, a great case in point is the Fair Chance Act. No, I understand what you're saying. One thing I just want you just to keep in mind when you write bills like this, and, and I'm talking very honestly about where we are as, as co-ops. When you, when you write a bill like this, what we're going to be very nervous about, there are a lot of what we call predatory lawyers out there who will seek to take anything and sue the co-op. So the co-op is going to be very defensive to make sure that it protects itself from exposure because when it has to pay these bills, it's, it's really the burden on, on all the uh, individuals who live there. We do a lot of things as co-ops to try to get people in. Uh, there are some people whose financials are just on the cusp. They're just below what we require. We don't want to kick them out we, because we're in, a, we're in the business of, of housing. So. Some people, what we'll say to them is that, listen, if you can put some money in escrow so we are satisfied that you will be able to meet your monthly maintenance obligations, you know, we can then look at that and approve. When you pass a bill like this, what that does, it tells the co-op you can no longer give any 
any amount of flexibility to those individuals. So in, in the end, what you end up doing, and this is in the real world, you end up hurting those people that you really, that, that really need the most help. So I, I just want you just to be cognizant of that when we do this, because we want to bring people in, but we, we are always afraid if we, when you get a bill like this, if you treat anyone slightly different, that'll be help, and if you don't do the same thing to the next person, it's going to be shown as discrimination. So what will happen is we'll stop doing that. So, Mr. Frederick, that, um, that was actually a very, I believe, intelligent thing you just said and intelligently moves the conversation forward, which is much different than the nonsensical part that I heard you say that there was no discrimination that exists to begin with. So when you, when you start off with an absurdity, uh, it sometimes clogs and fogs the mind. But I want to separate the absurdity that you originally said with the intelligent thing that you just said um, a little while ago, which I'm happy to and consider as we can work with you on forward. that. We really, we really but, can. But I, I, um, I would say also, even with the example that you just gave, you'd probably just write that down as to why you weren't discriminated against because your financials didn't meet and you would have satisfied these bills. And so uh, that example even wouldn't be a problem with the But the net, let, let's say somebody else came in, okay? And for, for maybe there's a whole host of other reasons why we wouldn't do that. I, I don't know what they are. I don't want to speculate. Uh, but if we didn't do that, we would then be fearful because we did it for one. We now have to do it for everybody else. Not and if really. we don't do it, but, but you say not really, but the lawyers will tell us that that would be discrimination then because you can't treat one different than something no. else. No, what, what this law says then that you would have to write down why you didn't give the apartment, the co-op to the next person. And again, you would have satisfied what the law requires. Can I just say one yeah. last thing? Sure. Okay, just by, I, I heard the uh, commissioner from, assistant commissioner of human rights say they don't have any written guidance from their agency regarding co-op boards and co-op board members. I think that's an essential document. As, as a lawyer uh, for co-op boards, a lot of the education comes from me. We have Marianne Rothman here. They have seminars, but I think that's something that uh, needs to, I, I think board members do need more education just to, just to understand what issues you're mentioning and how to avoid them. Sure. Um, I know when there are human rights complaints, they do, have, they do have training as part of the settlement, but maybe that's something that could be more proactive. You know, both a, po a, written, a written policy from the human rights and perhaps courses in, in, in discrimination or anti-discrimination training or whatever you may want to call it. Thank you. I think that's a, a good point. There are some people here from the administration. I would say that these bills will go a long way to provide some guidance as well. So, Agree to disagree. If I may, just, just backtracking a little bit. Sure. You said w this particular example that Bob cited where if someone was short $10,000, we have a perfect reason for writing we're not discriminating. The issue is that person wouldn't come into the co-op, where if we weren't worried about this, the person we could work with and we could develop a process where he could show us he could come in. So now... But why, yes. why, why can you not have a process that shows that he could come in now, or she? Well, again, that's right. In other words, we're rejecting him on financials. We have financials. This is the minimum standard. Sure. We're trying to work with them because maybe they have an unburdened, they have a, a large credit card debt. We'd say, why no, can you, you not work with them now with this bill in place? We would, the, 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 fe the fear would be that if you're now making an exception or some flexibility to your pre established financials for one, you would have to do it for everybody else. No. And if you, well, that, that, that's, what, that, that's what we believe based upon talking to attorneys that. If we don't do it for somebody Mr. else, Mr. Maisel, that is other, that what you believe that this person? law? Well, as, as an attorney for a couple, we, we always encourage, um, obviously, all applications to be treated equally right. and the sure. same. Sure. Uh, this bill has nothing to do with what you just said. You, there are a myriad of reasons of why you can reject someone over another. The example you gave has nothing to do um, with this bill. That's a decision that the person, that each particular co-op has to decide over. Uh, plethora of reasons, so I can't, I mean, I don't know, but if you deny somebody for financials for one, doesn't mean you have to accept them for another. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what example you were given and why you would not be able to work with them, but d we encourage you to work with everybody, and if you deny people, you're just going to say why you deny them. That's primarily what's happening with these bills. Council Mayor, if I, if I could, just to um, follow up on what Bob was saying, though, sure. is 
Uh, we've always uh, felt that in order to avoid claims of discrimination, it's important that we be consistent. Yeah. Okay, that there you, be you, absolute. That's what you believe right that now. There be ab that there be absolute consistency. So I just, just want to be—I want to be clear. That's what you believe right now. Yes, that's correct. So that, the that, law would change that's that. That's a policy that we try to ad adhere to, so that we do avoid discrimination, uh -huh. so that there's consistency, so that everybody is treated equally. But if you believe that now. Your example is already problematic with what you're currently doing. So why would these bills make it more problematic? Because the bill lays out a whole framework of what discrimination is. And if you read the bill, I, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that you know we encourage. Wait, wait, okay. no, no. Just hold, hold one second. They just said that sure. you right now currently insist on consistency to prevent the appearance of discrimination. I'll give you so an the example. example you just gave goes against what you already do. Is, is that correct? No, it's not correct. Okay, why is it I, not correct? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because if your bill, pa I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, somebody's a thousand dollars short or whatever. We have them put it in an escrow, and we work with them flexibility. Now they get in. Okay, now your bill is passed into law. Okay, and we have to give a reason for the de and a denial of. The, now the second person, the denial is financials. That person can then come back and say, wait a second, you're discriminating against me because you just treated person A who had a, a, f a financial situation differently than me. But your bill, let me just finish, your bill. No, I, need, I want to understand, so I need to pause right there. Because okay. based on what Mr. Schreiber said, you wouldn't do that because you have to treat them both equally currently. No, no, under your bill, if I have to... No, but before my, don't get to my bill yet. Okay. I'm talking about what you currently do now. We will try to be flexible because we're in the business of bringing people into our community. And that flies in the face of what Mr. Schreiber said. So I don't know which one is true. You're either treating everybody consistently or you try to be flexible. We treat people consistently, but when they're on the margins, on the cusp, in other words, they're very, very close, we will try to offer some flexibility to bring them in because, again, we're a housing cooperative. We want people in the community. But your bill, but your, but, but the bill. So you don't treat, there are points where you don't treat people cons, uh, consistently because you want to help them come in. If they are just on the market. I, I didn't ask you I'm, why. I'm I just said there are question. reasons. I'm there are times answer, when that. I'm answering your question. Yeah. Is that right, Mr. Schreiber? Uh, no, I, I don't. I, I don't agree with the with the way you with the way you're wording it, Mr. Schreiber. I'm not wording. I'm okay, repeating but, what I said. Right. Um, we treat everybody consistently in that we will. Look at everybody. What we always, what we always try to do in my this is fascinating to me. In, in my co-op, what we try to do when we receive an application, and we happen to see that there might be a slight deficiency in income, mm -hmm. we try to find a way to make it work. Yes. Okay. How can we make it work? Because we don't want to deny people. We want to give people housing. Okay. So we always look at it. How can we make this work? And that you should what continue we try to, to do that if these bills pass. I'm, I'm confused of why these bills will prevent you from continuing. Because I, I think that if this bill was to pass, um, if we were to allow one person to put money into escrow to make uh -huh. sure that they were able to meet their financial obligations, mm -hmm. and in uh, another instance, for whatever reason, we did not l allow another applicant to do that, we could be what would be the liable reason? for charges of discrimination. What would be so, the reason that you didn't do that? Uh, it, could low, it, could be any, it could be It could be any number of reasons. It could be um, that they had um, additional financial obligation. Yeah, but my uh, guess is before the laws pass, you still would not allow them to do that for the same reason. Uh, right, true. <laughs> true. I mean, okay. we still look at All right. but, but. But All right. in this I, I got it. I'm clear. Be open to charges of discrimination. I got and it. That would be a problem for us. I, um, whatever you're doing now, you can continue to do after the bill. So I, 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 I hear you. I Thank you know. so much. Uh, I appreciate you all taking the time to come up and help and explain how uh, a lot of uh, these Thank things you. work and illuminating some other things. Appreciate it. Uh, so we have our final. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a question? No, no. Oh. Uh, our final panel uh, David Tipson. Marianne Rothman, Fred Freeberg, and Craig Guerin. We've been, we've been joined by Councilmember Barron.
So we have Craig Gurian, we have Marian Rothman. Okay, we have everybody. All right, please raise your right hand. Do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. You have two minutes uh, to give your testimony. You can begin in the order of your preference. Thank you very much. I think you went in first. <laughs> My name is Craig Gurry, and I'm appearing today on behalf of Fair Play Legislation. I've been doing anti-discrimination work, primarily fair housing work. Uh, this is now my 30th year of doing that. <clears throat> I've been the principal author of many of the landmark changes to the New York City human rights law, starting with the comprehensive 1991 revisions to the law. I've, I have in the past taught for a number of years uh, fair housing law and practice at Fordham Law School. Um, I should, so the first thing I could say uh, is our problem is not that there's too much fair housing enforcement. Um, I've handed up two documents. Um, one is a statement from the only national fair housing organization, National Fair Housing Alliance, in support of Intro 1458. And the other is um, a debunking myths document. Because, Mr. Chairman, um, this bill and versions of this disclosure bill have been around for a long time. And there's, there's a script that the industry has to describe burden. There's, this bill is easy to comply with, but it's hard to evade. Um, so there, is, there are a series of reasons. Uh, it's said that there's preemption of the bill by the state. That's false. In fact, the state is not at all focused on trying to preserve secrecy. I heard somebody in the audience say today, it's a First Amendment problem to have this bill. That was a new one on me. The person apparently doesn't realize that what's being regulated by discrimination law is conduct and not speech, and apparently doesn't realize that the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act has been on the books for decades. So here's the situation, Mr. Chairman, uh, Council Member Lander. If you're turned down for a department store credit card under federal law for the last decades, you've been entitled to find out the sources of information. If you're turned down for your home, you can't find it out. I, I'm going to try to wrap it up pretty quickly, but there hasn't been a lot of civil rights uh, here. You, you can give a closing statement. We're going to go back and forth, so you no, have some opportunity. I, okay. The reason why there's an industry-wide practice of secrecy is because secrecy is effective. It's effective in deterring people from applying in the first place. And the whole thing comes down to not wanting to have your reason for a rejection nailed down. Co-ops, like other discrimination defendants, want to have the flexibility to come up with after-the-fact reasons. It's not appropriate. And I hope particularly any members who have stayed, if there are any, who know all the members who oppose the bill have left. I, I hope that uh, those who have concerns about the bill will ask us about those concerns. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, my name is Fred Freiberg. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to make a presentation today. Um, I'm the founder and executive director of the Fair Housing Justice Center. We're a regional civil rights organization. We serve all of New York City and seven surrounding New York counties. We have a full service fair housing program and we speak today in support of Intro 1458. In our view, this bill will <clears throat> bring greater fairness, accountability, and transparency to a process that has uh, for too long been cloaked in secrecy. <clears throat> I have a lot of questions I hope were uh, or a lot of uh, statements I'd like to make that I hope will be addressed in the question and answer period, but I do want to say that over the past decade, uh, our organization has received dozens of complaints from individuals who are seeking to purchase shares in or rent uh, from housing cooperatives. Most of these complaints have alleged race, national origin, disability, family status, age, or sexual orientation discrimination. I do want to address later, I hope, I'll, I hope I'll have the opportunity to address later the issue of numbers 
and what numbers mean or what they, they don't mean, but I, I want to uh, state for the record that numbers, whether you're looking at complaints we've received or complaints government agencies receive, uh, do not usually reflect the actual amount of discrimination in the marketplace. Uh, and I can illustrate that with a number of examples uh, based on our work. We have one of the most sophisticated testing programs in the nation, and I don't want to up my colleague here, but I've been working on housing discrimination for 42 years in this nation, and, and I can tell you that uh, there is systemic discrimination based on race and national origin in virtually all segments of the housing market yet, and we haven't done enough to eliminate it. I do think the Fair Residential Cooperative Disclosure Law requires uh, cooperatives to identify and disclose in a timely manner the specific reason or reasons for rejecting an applicant is a good thing. Once a rejected applicant receives a clear reason or reasons for denial, the consumer can better evaluate whether they have any reason to believe that unlawful discrimination has occurred. In closing, under this law, should a consumer decide to pursue a housing discrimination complaint or lawsuit, a co-op can defend itself based only on the reasons provided to the applicant. We believe this would bring greater transparency, accountability, and equi equity to the process. We urge you to pass, pass this law. It's a reasonable piece of legislation consistent with the spirit and letter of the city human, right, human rights law. Um, and it will help to ensure the fair housing rights of New Yorkers are protected in housing cooperatives. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Williams, <clears throat> members of the committee. My name is David Tipson. I'm executive director of New York Appleseed, a nonprofit organization which advocates for integrated schools and communities and has specifically addressed the problem of school segregation in New York City for the last seven years in partnership with uh, two of the sponsors of this bill. I am testifying today in support of Intro 1458, the Fair Residential Cooperative Disclosure Law, which would require cooperative corporations to provide prospective purchasers with a written statement of each and all its reasons for withholding consent to a sale. New York City is one of the most segregated cities in the nation. The New York Times found in 2012 that the New York City public school system is the third most segregated urban district in the nation. These facts are not accidents, but the result of intentional and official policies that have, been, that have promoted and perpetuated segregation over more than a century. We cannot continue to put our heads in the sand in the face of undeniable evidence that racism continues to, severe, to limit severely the housing options available to peace, people of color. While housing segregation is far from the only cause of school segregation in New York City, it, it is unquestionably the primary cause. New York Appleseed's work has revealed that the street and block one lives on can determine sometimes decisively one's access to educational opportunity. Living in predominantly white areas typically affords far greater access to the most successful and popular schools. Only through strong and consistent enforcement of local, state, and federal fair housing laws can we overcome the shameful history of residential segregation in New York City and maintain hope for a truly integrated school system. New York, Apple, New York, New York Appleseed fully supports the testimony of uh, the Fair Housing Justice Center and the Anti-Discrimination Anti Center and their analysis of the proposed legislation. Intro 1458 is long overdue in common sense legislation requiring simple disclosure of the reason that an otherwise qualified buyer is denied access to a housing cooperative. Co-op boards complying with the fair housing laws have nothing to fear. Thank you. Ms. Rothman, I think we put you on the wrong panel, but. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm flexible. <laughs> uh, my name is Marianne Rothman. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Williams, members of the committee, and congratulations to everyone on four more years as of yesterday. Um, you have my written testimony. I will ta give selections from it to try to stay within the two minutes that I no longer have, um, and then a couple of comments, kind of a little bit more from the heart. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Rothman. I'm executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, which is a membership organization providing information, education, and advocacy to cooperative and condominiums located throughout the five boroughs of New York City and beyond. More than 170,000 New York families make their homes in our member buildings, which range from very modest income restricted building house uh, buildings to solid middle-class garden apartments, uh, 
and some very upscale dwellings. The common thread is that all of these buildings are owned by their residents and operated as self-governing representative democracies providing a wide range of home ownership options to thousands of diverse New Yorkers. And responsibility is a key word. Buying into a cooperative is significantly different from buying a house. The prospective cooperative or, uh, or unit owner acquires a living space, of course, but they also commit to the community, or we hope that they will. We ask that they participate in the, go the governing structure of their new home, which may include attending meetings, um, other obligations, serving on committees, sharing their expertise, being an integral part of what makes the co-op or condo work, not a mere resident of the unit with the good view. Um, may I? You can give a closing sentence. Uh, well, I'd like to close, among other things, by saying that we strongly support Mr. Gerodnik's bill, um, and that that. Co housing cooperatives have proven, nobody approves of discrimination and we are more than happy to work with you to find good tools to root it out. But housing cooperatives have proven their worth again and again as viable homes, as places where per people work together as communities. The admissions process has proven in the Great Recession that it really, really works. Very few individual cooperators have faced failure um, in very hard times, and cooperatives themselves have survived and turned around and thrived. Um, I'm a real, true believer in co-ops, and uh, I hope that you'll understand the strong sense of community and togetherness I, that, that all kinds of cooperatives have and that does and should exist in your Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I know my colleague probably has some questions. Um, I, the one thing I do want to say, actually the most illuminating thing here was I think Mr. Gurian's statement is easy to comply with but hard to evade. Um, and just for the sake of the other side, even if it's a little harder to comply with, I think the hard to evade part is where all of this comes from. And uh, it was just illuminating when he said it, and I appreciate it. Same thing with the Fair Chance Act. We didn't do much except say you have to change where you ask a question. And that made it hard to evade when there was any discrimination uh, against someone. And this right here, again, is just hard to evade that you have to, have to do something, and it may, it may illuminate some things people don't want to illuminate it. And so I think that's, that's very telling. And, the exchange that we had with the, with the last panel, although I respect everything they're, they're doing, just kind of reinforced that. There's this, there's, this, there's this thing that we don't want to force people to say something or, or do something when it comes around discrimination issues. And I think that's a, that's a problem we just have to continue to, to, to barrel through. But I'm going to go to my colleague for the three minutes of question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Freiberg, in your written testimony, you have a couple examples that you didn't have time to say, and it does seem to me that's something we really just didn't bring into the room at the at the top. And I, you know, I think that's part of why it's like hard to understand why this matters. Uh, but it matters because it, it affects real people's lives. I just wonder if you could if you could give us a couple of those examples of complaints that have been brought to you where people were believed strongly they have been discriminated against in cooperative applications. Well, we've had a number of me. We've had a number of complaints involving the LGBT community where people have shown up for their interviews and they've been treated rudely and, and uh, ultimately rejected without a reason given. Sometimes outrageous comments have been made. In one case, uh, a woman who was openly lesbian uh, said, well, you're not really what we were expecting uh, when she entered the room and, and uh, as if they had some uh, notion of what she would look like. Uh, because they had been informed ahead of time that it was for her and her partner that they were seeking a, a, a co-op. And, and I, you know, whether it's somebody who was, uh, we had a South Asian man who was um, ultimately turned down and, and uh, one person on the board was alleged to have said if his name was easier to pronounce, he might have been accepted. And there's inferences and suggestions that these people come to us with that discrimination may have occurred, but they're given nothing, no reason at all. And they're not obligated to give a reason 
uh, under the law right now uh, as to why they were, were uh, turned down. And so they believe in, in this, in the case of the South Asian man, I can tell you his financials were impeccable, the best I've ever seen for anyone try, attempting to purchase a co-op. So it certainly wasn't a financial issue in his case. Um, I know we've heard these sterling examples of diverse co-ops uh, in earlier testimony today, but there's a lot of co-ops that are racially homogeneous in this city. And there's no reason to believe that in such situations that bias doesn't infect the process from time to time. And the processes don't take place exactly as was represented by the last panel. There are lots of different ways in which co-ops operate. Some are very informal. They operate in a basement with a few members present uh, to interview prospective applicants. And so we've seen discrimination over and over again, but the problem really is that there's no way people feel confident about pursuing their claims because they don't have a reason. And if they were given a reason, whether it was pretext or not, it would give them a better way to evaluate whether their civil rights had been violated and whether it was worthwhile to pursue any kind of complaint. And, and I just want to underline, kind of this to me is sort of the key point. I mean, you guys have been doing fair housing and anti-discrimination litigation and housing for decades. You believe, based on all that experience, that the difference between pursuing a successful case, assuming there was discrimination in, the, you know, in those cases, would be very substantial from where these two individuals chose not to pursue a claim because they just didn't have anything to go on. They would have been stuck with total he said, she said, and a situation where even if a false pretextual reason had been given, they would have had a much stronger ability to pursue a claim. Absolutely. 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 It's, it's at every stage of the process. So it's the person who's been turned down having something to look at and say, does this add up? It's the ability to get counsel. I, th I think something happened to me. Well, what? I, you know, I don't know what it is. I, if I may want to just give another example of a kind of discrimination that occurs and why it's not always on its face and why, Mr. Chairman, there's no CIA plot or collusion that's required. Um, I've had a circumstance, um, actually I dealt with this not as an attorney but in a, in a different context where I'm, that I'm familiar with, where an individual member of a board actually did not want the applicant because the applicant had a young child and the person on the board felt that there'd be noise running around over her head. It didn't take a campaign on her part to get a majority of the board to say we're against children. What she did was become the prime mover of raising objections. She was motivated by a discriminatory reason and then she took it upon herself to trash the application on other grounds. So a single board member can infect the process with discrimination as well. I, I would agree with that, uh, Councilman Lander, and I would also add that <clears throat> because you raised this earlier is when you were talking to the commission about their testing program and you know that you can't test in this world well I know better than anyone that you can't do testing in the co-op uh, scenario that you, you you can't go far enough into the process to really compare uh, treatment and and if there was a way to do that I mean a lot of people might say there's not a lot of systemic race discrimination in the rental market in New York City if you were to base it only on complaints filed with government agencies but I know from having sent testers into neighborhoods in Brooklyn and the Bronx and Queens and other places that there is systemic race, racial discrimination in the marketplace, but it's so subtle, so cleverly accomplished that no one can, no ordinary consumer can detect that discrimination uh, is taking place. And I'll just leave it here, but I, I do want to, this helps me make a closing point that I do want to make about cooperatives in general. I love cooperatives. I helped set up some limited equity cooperatives when I was at the Fifth Avenue Committee. I think it's a marvelous form of ownership. I wholeheartedly agree. We did rental discrimination first. That's why we passed that bill a couple of years ago. This We don't believe that it's more or less pervasive in the cooperative marketplace. We're not targeting cooperatives for anything. Uh, we just, 
when we thought that there was more discrimination in the rental marketplace than we were than we were aware of, we had a tool for it. We passed a law to strengthen and require the commission, and they've moved forward on that tool. Um, and what we're looking to do here is provide some protections against that discrimination taking place in cooperatives. So, um, you know, we may disagree about whether this is a modest burden and what the consequences will be. I will say we have evidence of that from Suffolk and Hempstead, and if anybody would show me one uh, cooperative board in Suffolk or Hempstead that found this law too difficult to comply with, I'd be glad to talk to them. So I think the evidence suggests where there is evidence, and the panel before talked about it, the evidence suggests that this law is not a heavy burden um, and that it will provide a modest remedy. Um, but it's certainly not the case that we're seeking to target cooperatives. We're just trying to make a fairer city. So. I'm, I'm comforted, Brad. But may, I know I'm not supposed to ask questions from here. <laughs> but in the instance that the gentleman just cited of an individual board member with their own agenda throwing up other barricades the the reason that would be given for the rejection probably wouldn't be the true reason if that woman were clever enough to have disguised it so how would one get to the truth? Uh, that, that seems fair. We don't usually have panels with is, people from opposite sides. If this is if this is permissible, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this this came up a, a little bit uh, uh, earlier in a colloquy uh, that uh, Councilmember Lander had with a member of a panel. But it's precisely the provision of a reason that enables someone to say, well. I guess I didn't. I guess I didn't have twice the uh, purchase price in remaining in remaining assets. What is true? What it, what is true about the circumstances? Once the reason is provided, as the representative from the Commission on Human Rights said, that's a very good starting point. Let's say that the reason given is you haven't had the same job for at least two years. Well, the first thing that the person does is say, well, that, that, can't, be, that can't be true. Uh, I have had the job. Or they may wind up saying, well, that's interesting because Mrs. Jones in 3B, who a broker has also sold the apartment to, she didn't have her job for as much as two years, and she was let in. It, it's, the ap, it's the absence of reasons. And, and really, let's try to bring this back down to earth. What the co-ops are looking for, whether it's put in terms of vulnerability to litigation or just the desire to help everyone, I, I know that's not your point, Ms. Rothman, is co-ops like other entities would love it or do love the situation where you have flexibility to invent after the fact reasons, post hoc reasons for your conduct. You can shape the reasons provided if a discrimination case ever comes up. And what this bill does is it does take away flexibility. It says that the people, and this is very important, Mr. Chairman, in terms of this burden question, it's no mystery what happens. Members of a co-op board are sitting in a room. They talk about the application or the applicant. They make a decision. They know, sitting in that room, what the reasons were. And all that's being said is, we don't want to be pinned down to those reasons. That should not be comforting. This is the only industry that I have ever heard of that says, if people knew why we do, what we do, 
our industry would be ruined. L uh, let Counsel. me just make a final statement and not a question okay. and then turn it back over, because I do agree that there is some f a flaw in this bill, which is that there will be many situations, or some situations, where a person was genuinely discriminated against, but where the reason that's provided in the letter stands up at the Human Rights Commission. And sometimes people who were genuinely victims of discrimination will not be able to win redress under the law, because even though in that small number of cases where there was really active discrimination, if you had a videotape, everybody would know it. Still, they will provide that letter. The Human Rights Commission will see it. The letter will stand up, and they will be granted no remedy. And I'll be sad about that, because those will be victims of discrimination who we didn't help. But at least in some situations where there was discrimination, this would provide a remedy or a path to remedy which, was not, which does not today exist. So the whole point that the reasons might sometimes be false, it is a good criticism of the bill. It's just it's a criticism of the bill that it won't be strong enough to solve the problem and not that it's too big a burden. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to say, just, Mr. Rothman, just so we're clear, because in the Fair Chance Act, we did two things. All we did was... We changed when you have to ask the question, because everybody said, obviously, this would ruin everybody's ability to, to be in business. It also said it's not, it's not necessary because um, discrimination is illegal. And they also said that they're not discriminating against because someone had a, a criminal history. And what we found was that when they, when they asked the question up front, the applications went into the circular file. There was no real, it's the garbage can. Uh, there were no real reasons given of why this person wasn't being hired. Uh, we couldn't figure out whether the person was explicitly discriminated against, uh, except we had a lot of anecdotal evidence that um, decided that. And what we said was only that you can now ask whether you have a criminal history after you've evaluated the person, you can then ask the question. And if you deny them, you have to give the reasons if it's connected to criminal history. That one act exponentially increased the amount of people who are saying they're discriminated at now. Because now there was something that we can hold on to and say, um, you discriminated against me because you asked this question either earlier or you liked me up until this one point. And so having a reason or having a thing that you can hold on to does begin to germinate the ability to now say perhaps I was discriminated against because the reason that was given isn't true or I can prove that it wasn't the same for someone else. So there's a, there's a long litany of things that you can now do once that reason is given that you couldn't do before, which is why I think the hard to evade part is what gives people the most consternation. And I want to ask you, is that a, part, a big part of why you're, like to me there seems to be uh, two things going on here. One is people just don't like the time frame that we had. And then, uh, and of course, well, more than two things. There's, there's the penalty, there's a time frame, and there's just, you have to give a reason. What in your mind is the biggest problem with giving a reason of why someone is denied? The biggest problem. Um, well, I think, I, I, the, what I tried to elicit from the gentleman at the end is that um, his story had a t one person with a fault, with a discriminatory motive, who moved the rest of the board by diversion, really. So uh, the reasons bill, if I understand it, would require the board to give as reasons the consensus that she brought them to, and wouldn't ever, if she were clever at what she had done, wouldn't really include her motivation so sure. there's a there's well, what's a, wrong with that well we won't get at the truth i mean the truth is in his example I'm, one person so that it. aside let's let's pretend we're all just foolish crazy people we won't get to the truth what's wrong still with requiring that there's a reason given why someone is denied well I guess that decades of case law have affirmed our right not to give reasons, so mm. I would like that to prevail. Um, I don't know to what degree um, the reasons given would indeed be accurate or complete, so I don't know how productive such I a see. bill would be. The punitive aspect is 
draconian. I, want, I just want to stick. First of all, from my point. I, wait, of view, I just want to stick on the, the one were, part. No, no, the one the part. Oh. The worst part about it is that it will discourage good, capable people from volunteering to serve their co-op community and to be board members. Um, I just have to say that I have heard no reason why people shouldn't put in writing why um, someone is not being allowed to be put in a co-op. What you just said, I think, might have been the worst reason, which is that um, the decades' ability to not give a reason should remain without a reason. So that's just, it says to me that really this is about being able to continue to evade certain things and being able uh, to not have to give a reason just because we won't, we've been doing it that way, which says to me there might be something, um, sp you know, implicitly clandestine about it, even if it isn't explicit. But there's a problem there if no one can give me a reason as to why they should not be able to provide a reason to someone who's being denied. That that just sounds kind of bad. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. There should be a reason. There should be an explanation of why we think giving a reason to someone who is denied somehow hurts the co-op. Perhaps if your bill were not so incredibly punitive and didn't force board members to face the possibility of both private right of action and um, uh, city investigation, possibly people might feel less threatened and enormous fines. Possibly people might feel less threatened by it. Uh, I do want to look at the, the punitive part of it. I will say without those private right of actions, without punitive things occurring, people don't, out of the goodness of their heart, do the things that we ask them to do. And so without the stick, n nothing happens. Um, we'll end up with... But I just want to say, it lets, if, we, if, we, if we operate from the from the thought process that discriminate, although not every panelist agree, but if we operate from the thought point of view that discrimination does happen uh, and we want to prevent it from happening, if we put something up there that says you do this and we can help with the discrimination issue, and we say if you don't do it, nothing happens, I don't really believe that the discrimination is going to stop. You have to have a stopgap there, and so the, the punitive nature it does that. And so. I, I want to look the, at the very example that we've been given here. Unfortunately, your bill doesn't give us a shot at getting at the truth or at the, the hard. No, you're going to another question. I, I'm not even going to that. I'm just saying what what's presented doesn't seem overly punitive on its face value, providing a reason why you're denying someone. No one has given me a reason. Uh, um, no one's given me a reason why we shouldn't do that. The other part is we believe it will at least begin to help someone make a case if they've been discriminated against. And in order for them to be able to build that case, you have to do the thing we ask you to do. And you're not going to do it if nothing happens if you don't do it. And that's just the way it is. So with every one of these things, Fair Chance Act, uh, the bias-based policing bill, everybody has wanted us to take out the um, ability to sue for some reason or other. And if we take it out, the teeth are gone. At least with the bias-based policing as of last year, um, we were told the whole world was going to crumble and, so, and officers were going to get sued. They were going to lose their home, all kind of foolishness. Um, there were zero lawsuits as of last year. It may have changed by now. Um, so this, the world doesn't generally crumble when these things occur. Um, there's some positive things that happen, and so we want to see those positive things occur. If there's issues around timing for some reason or issues around the punitive uh, um, the damages, although it's not my bill, I actually want to hear them. Uh, but in terms of putting something in writing, no one has given me any reason why we shouldn't do that, except you just don't want to because we want to make everything in secrecy, which we can't do anymore. Um, the last thing I want to mention in terms of um, diversity, and I believe that a lot of those comments were earnest in certain examples, 
what I tend to find, and I tend to find, and this covers everybody in terms of diversity, but what I tend to find, and I want to make sure this is on the record, when people talk about diversity, it usually excludes black families and black people. And so I just want to make sure uh, that we put that on the record because it's usually diversity other than that, and we want to make sure we include them as well. With that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. May sure. I just put one data one data point on the record that uh, hasn't been discussed sure. yet yet today. Um, many years ago, um, when a bill very uh, almost identical to this one was pending, that was when Mayor De Blasio was in the council and was a co-sponsor of the disclosure bill. Um, we had a professional survey organization do a survey of co-op owners. And so it was a very, it was a very particular survey. Um, it, it, it definitely skewed white. It was co-op owners of private co-ops in Manhattan below 96th Street who were not themselves co-op board members. In other words, the people that the panelists you've heard here today purport to represent. In a, in a survey, those co-op members themselves supported disclosure by a margin of two to one. The opposition here comes from a very small but very vocal part of an industry, board members and uh, its organizations and agents. This is not the broad view of co-op owners overall, and the survey data show that. Thank you. Ms. Rothman. Excuse me, but it's the responsibility of every shareholder in a co-op to be part of the governance of their co-op and to take their turn serving on boards or on committees or otherwise sharing their expertise. So it isn't an us and them, it's an us, 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 us in a properly run co-op community. So to, 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 to have hunted out people who had, never, who had lived in a co-op for a length of time but had never served on their board is kind of disappointing to me. Oh, Mr. Gearing, sorry, it's okay, I got, I got your point. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rothman, uh, for your uh, point as well. Um, I, I do want to say I, I, I'm actually leaving this hearing more wanting to pass these bills than I entered in the hearing. Um, I'm aghast at some of the things that I heard and some of the reasons that were put forth that really were not intelligent <laughs> as in terms of why we shouldn't do certain portions of this. There are all certain portions that I want to look at and, and make sure we adjust, but there was some that there were just, just there was no basis for, for the opposition except for there's an industry that doesn't want additional disclosure and wants to remain in secrecy. Um, maybe someone can change my mind to that, but that certainly, opposition to that, to what I just said, hasn't come across in any of the testimony that I've heard and people have had ample time. Uh, the fact that people don't want to just say why they denied somebody doesn't hold up in any argument anywhere except for people just want to remain secret and why, I don't know. So um, with that, for the record, we have Associated Builders and Owners in, of Greater New York, the Broadmoor Co-op, and New York State Associates and Realtors. I want to thank this panel uh, for taking the time uh, to come up. I know Ms. Rothman has a tough job, and I appreciate uh, the work that you do as well. With that, the hearing is now closed. I, I want to thank the sergeants as well for their job. Thank you.